afternoon um, as you can see it's not full but um, uh, that probably has to do with uh, corona <laughs> and um, the weather was not that beautiful but we value everybody who has come here today to celebrate with us the language diversity here in Amsterdam and of course from harte welkom soyez le bienvenu marhaban Bon bini! Uh, muy bienvenidos! What more? Please tell me, what more? Wait, 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 wait! Tell me, tell me, who? Who? Thank you! Who more? Any other language today? Yes, please! Herzlich willkommen! Herzlich willkommen! Aber natürlich! Entschuldigung, die habe ich noch vergessen! Yeah. Yes, please! Gerben! Thank you. Kurdish, thank you. Yes. Benvenuti a tutti quanti. Mm -hmm. But of course. One day. You know what? Uh, I think she... Wait, 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 wait. We're going to do it this way. That's why we have this one. Can you catch it? I'm not sure. Let's try. Privit <laughs> Usim, <laughs> Ukrainian. Oh. <laughs> it's soft, it's soft. Thank you. Any more? Oh, we could have kept it there. One more time. I'll catch it. Catch it. Oh, sorry. One more time. I didn't I didn't get that one. Bainvind. And what language? Portuguese. Portuguese, Bainvind, yeah. Teretula must. Estonian. Estonian. How great. Any more? Yes, over there. Guys, <laughs> better. What language? Great. <laughs> Great. Do I have all the languages? Yeah. yeah? Oh, here. Okay. Yes. Pariegak. It's Armenian. <laughs> Wonderful. You see how great. Do we have them all now? You think? Yeah? Great. <sighs> so now we can start. And um, yeah, we are hoping to reach as much people as possible by, you know, by using English this afternoon. Um, but of course, so many languages, so many ideas also about that. Um, um, but this afternoon we're going to talk about multilingualism. How important is that, especially in this time? And how did we look at it 
in the years before? And how do we look at it now? What are the new insights? We have four wonderful speakers this afternoon. And, um, and at the end, we'll have a panel discussion to see what the ideas are of the several themes that we have. And um, it's maybe good to know that after the four speakers, we'll have a really short break. If you have to go to the bathroom, you have a, a possibility. And after that, there will be, will be the panel discussion. And also good to know, after we finish here, you're all invited, of course, to come to the Voyer and have a, um, a drink all together and maybe talk a little bit more, get to know each other a little bit better and maybe get some more information about the speakers of this afternoon. Please be aware that this afternoon will be filmed. Um, well, it, the, the stage will be filmed, uh, but maybe if you want to say something, it's just good to, uh, to be aware of that. And, um, yeah, did I, yeah, my name, Fengwa uh, Alwi. Well, I was, uh, I was uh, born in Utrecht, in Holland. Uh, Moroccan father, Dutch mother, raised in Utrecht. Um, and I think um, I was one of the kids that was at least empowered, not being protected, but empowered. And, um, but I do remember when I was little about, um, how people said, um, yeah, those foreigners, they have to learn Dutch, they have to speak our language. Of course, of course, it's important. But it was really funny when years later I was living on Curacao and um, a large group of Dutch people coming from, uh, Curacao is part of the Dutch kingdom, of course, and um, Dutch is spoken over there, but the real language of the island is Papiamentu. I forgot to say Bombini, did I? No, I did. Okay, Bombini. Yeah. And um, it was funny to see how, I mean, not everybody, but a large group of Dutch people didn't speak Papiamento. And I always had to think about being young and people telling me, yeah, those Moroccans, those Turkish people, they have to learn Dutch. And I thought, okay, what about this? Don't you have to learn the Papiamento now? And uh, I mean, you know, it's okay, but it's just always good to know, you know? Um, language is a way to communicate with each other, and for me, that is the most important thing, if we keep communicating with each other. And I think uh, that's one of the main reasons why we have this afternoon. Uh, but I have uh, said enough because this afternoon, is uh, organized um, at one hand by Locomotiva and uh, on the other hand together with Oba. And I'm very happy to uh, give the stage to Bozena Kopzinska. And I hope I said it right because we really practiced. <laughs> and um, to give her the stage to do the <coughs> official opening of this afternoon. Very much. 180 nationalities there in Amsterdam. I have a little game to play because I'm very curious actually how many languages everybody speak. So can people who speak at least two languages stand up? Can the people who speak three languages keep standing up and... Wow! <laughs> can the people who speak four languages keep standing up? and then five languages, six, I get more than that, wow, <laughs> that's exciting. Do you speak seven? No. No, six, <laughs> great. So we are really in the multilingual okay, world. Oh, right. Do you I'm speak kidding. eight? Italian, mother tongue, then uh, Dutch, English, Portuguese from Brazil, Spanish, uh, Francais, un petit, peu. And actually, in Italy, kind of everyone, almost everyone is, is, is bilingual because you have also the dialect. That's because of Napolitan. Right. Yeah, that's the trick. Language diversity is not 
not a new phenomenon in Amsterdam. Actually, in 15th, 16th, 17th century, when the passengers got out in the docks in the harbor of Amsterdam, they were getting into a bubble of languages. There were many of them. Uh, Dam was as busy then as it is now. The, there was a meeting point. Uh, you could have uh, gotten all the latest news. Um, it meant connections to faraway lands, business deals, access to new ideas. Uh, migration, that's also nothing new. There was always a lot of migration. I think the big difference uh, lies in the numbers. In 1990, there were 155 million people on move. According to the latest statistics, in 2020, it has doubled in size. 300 million people do not live in a country where they were born. So the future, especially the future of our children, is really multilingual. Um, the world is on the move. There is no denying that, and it's a fact, and we have to live with that. Um, as you can see, I'm a migrant. I moved several times in my life. I moved to different countries, and I moved to different uh, uh, continents. And when you move, uh, of course, when you decide to stay in one country, you have to learn the language. You have to learn the culture. You have to learn the traditions. But to be able to do that well, you have to be proud of who you are. You have to know your own identity. You have to know your roots. And the language is a part of it. In Amsterdam, on the Kronbomslot, there is this very beautiful refugee monument. I don't know if you have ever, ever seen that. But it's a tree of life. Actually, it consists of two um, segments. It's a tree of life that's beautifully growing into the sky. And next to it is a trunk where it came from. These are the roots. So the tree, to be able to grow, it has to have the roots. If it doesn't have the roots, it grows very little and it's very small. So the roots and the language and the tradition, it's very important. I live myself in a multilingual family. My son is trilingual and I cannot imagine that I wouldn't be able to speak Polish to him. Uh, because this, this is my biggest vocabulary that I have. I can teach him the words that I cannot teach him in any other language. As I speak five languages myself, but my biggest vocabulary, I don't have any accent, it's in my mother tongue. So uh, it's almost von selbstsprechend, <laughs> self-explanatory, how important the mother language is. Um, um, International Mother Language Day, which we celebrated just a week ago, uh, it was celebrated for the 20th time. The UNESCO has proclaimed that uh, uh, exactly 20 years ago. It's a day to celebrate the mother language tongue. So I welcome you to all to this celebration um, today of the mother language tongue and its use in education. Welcome everybody. Thank you very much, Rosina. And then we'll go to our first speaker of this afternoon. She arrived all the way from Paris. Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh. I'm getting on here. Okay. Yeah, when I was telling it, I was... No. Sorry, Karijn Helsloot. There you are. She's a senior advisor in language policy and multilingualism. She studied Italian language and literature at the UVA and she received her doctorate in theoretical linguistics about the rhythmic structure of language. Interesting. For over 20 years, she has been working on multilingualism and language policy at Studio Taalwetenschap and developed several programs for education. The language center of the Department of Defense is on her account and she set up the Teachers College for the Windesheim. From 2016 till 2019, she was project manager uh, of the pilot Taal naar Keuze, a supplementary language supplementary language education at the Esprit schools and since October 2019 she is president of the foundation Taal naar Keuze. Yeah, and you're, come to, you're not coming from Paris right now. You're coming from 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 just around the corner. Just, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Take it away. Yeah. 
sorry. There you go. No, it's it working. No. Yeah. Is it? Is it working? Yes. yes. And now I need to use this one too, and just need to check whether it's there's a lot of light. Uh, but let me see. I think I will stay here. Uh, probably I don't need my glasses. Uh, I wanted to do a kind of opal, a small opal chair, a one person, one language, not one parent, one language, with my, um, my master student, my trainee from uh, Armenia, uh, Reni, uh, but uh, we made a, a bilingual presentation, Dutch and English. So I will switch to Dutch now, and, uh, but no problem if you don't uh, understand or cannot formulate any questions or whatever in Dutch, no problem. But uh, I hope you will follow everything. I'm going into a lot of uh, Dutch um, laws and acts, so it is uh, too difficult to do it uh, quickly, in a quick way, in uh, English for me. Dus ik ga door in het Nederlands. We gaan het hier over hebben, over meer talen in het onderwijs. Daar zijn we eigenlijk al een hele tijd mee bezig. En het is de verantwoordelijkheid van scholen en van ons allemaal eigenlijk, van de hele gemeenschap natuurlijk en samenleving. Waar heb ik het over als ik zeg meer talen? U hoort mij goed allemaal, denk ik, als ik hem zo heb. Ja. Uh, meer talen gaat over de thuistalen of eerste talen. En gaat natuurlijk ook over de nationale taal, over het Nederlands. En over dialecten die er in Nederland zijn. En gaat ook over vreemde talen. Alles nemen we bij elkaar. School, waar ik het over heb vandaag, gaat over uh, basisonderwijs en over het uh, voortgezet onderwijs. En uh, gemeenschap, society gaat dus over ons allemaal. We hebben allemaal verantwoordelijkheid in um, zorgen dat er meer talen op school gaan komen. Want waarom is dat zo ontzettend nodig? Um, dat is met name natuurlijk die migratie die er is, de enorme uh, etnische verscheidenheid die de uh, stad kenmerkt, maar eigenlijk het hele land kenmerkt en heel Europa kenmerkt en de hele wereld zo langzamerhand. Um, en uh, we hebben het over uh, diversiteit, of superdiversiteit wordt al gezegd. Maar er wordt ook heel veel gesproken over de segregatie, over um, uh, exclu exclusie, eigenlijk uh, racisme en alle vormen van achterstand die plaatsvinden bij hele specifieke groepen. Um, veelal heeft dat met de sociaal-economische status te maken van gezinnen, de opleiding van ouders, maar ook zeker de etnische achtergrond. En heel vaak wordt gesproken dus over ja, taalachterstand. En dan wordt bedoeld um, achterstand in het Nederlands. En um, wat is nou eigenlijk het antwoord? Daar zijn we met een hele groep mensen al eigenlijk langdurig mee bezig. Ik wil zeker op deze plek uh, Guus Extra eventjes noemen. De hoogleraar al lang intussen met emeritaat van de Universiteit van Tilburg. Die daar al 20, 30 jaar geleden ook zeer actief in was. En met hem... Ook uh, Jacques Minortier bijvoorbeeld, of René Appel, of Pieter Muisken. Uh, allemaal mensen die toen ook al actief bezig waren daarin. Um, er is heel veel, wat is het antwoord namelijk om, om te zorgen dat er die segregatie ophoudt en ook dat um, iedereen zich welkom voelt en ook iedereen zich in het onderwijs goed kan ontwikkelen? Nou, dat is uh, die, wat we noemen dus die taalinclusieve uh, onderwijsvorm, language inclusive education. Um, Piet van Avermaat had, uh, zag ik, hoorde ik vanmorgen nog even een, een mooi verhaal van de Universiteit Gent, hoogleraar, over ditzelfde onderwerp. Dat is een, uh, een, um, uh, een uh, verhaal dat hij uh, net heeft uh, opgenomen. Daar gaat het ook over, datzelfde term. Heel veel wetenschappelijk uh, grondslag is er al voor, pedagogisch gezien, psychologisch en taalkundig natuurlijk. Uh, dat, dat die cognitieve ontwikkeling van het kind is ontzettend belangrijk um, en die so uh, sociaal-emotionele uh, aspecten van een uh, kind dat thuis met een andere taal opgroeit naast het Nederlands, met het Nederlands uh, en misschien wel met uh, allerlei verschillende talen. Uh, dat taalkundige onderzoek, dat is natuurlijk al tientallen jaren bezig hè, om te kijken hoe sowieso taalverwervingsprocessen verlopen, de transfer van de ene taal naar de, tweede, naar de andere taal toe, naar de tweede taal toe. Uh, er wordt al heel erg lang, of in ieder geval structureel, 
um, gekeken naar de grammaticale eigenschappen van talen en die worden vergeleken. Dat is niet een heel erg lange traditie, maar toch wel zo'n 40, 50 jaar lang met Chomsky is dat begonnen, wordt dat heel structureel gedaan. En dat is ontzettend belangrijk om te zien dat talen heel veel met elkaar delen. Talen lijken heel erg veel op elkaar, ook al willen we dat meestal niet uh, uh, horen. Dat is natuurlijk zo. Fonologisch gezien, fonetisch gezien, zijn er enorm veel verschillen. Ga ik nu niet op in, dat is ooit voor een andere keer. Uh, maar het is heel erg belangrijk, ook voor leerkrachten, om uh, je te realiseren dat talen eigenlijk allemaal opgebouwd zijn uit dezelfde soort elementen. Uh, er is intussen ook al heel veel uh, praktijk. Er is heel veel gedaan op heel veel verschillende plekken, buiten Nederland ook, maar ook in Nederland, waarbij uh, verschillende onderwijsvormen worden gebruikt, waarbij verschillende talen uh, gebruikt worden, vergeleken worden, gebruikt kunnen worden bij het, in het onderwijs. Ik heb materialen hier, ik heb materialen straks daar verder en zeker de andere sprekers die komen, die gaan daar ook verder op in. Ik laat het uh, nu. Uh, waarom is het de verantwoordelijkheid van het onderwijs zelf, van de scholen zelf, om er iets mee te gaan doen? Het is niet zomaar een gunst, iets wat we aan ze moeten vragen of ze dat alsjeblieft willen doen. Nee, het is een plicht en het is een enorm belangrijke plicht. Misschien zijn we zelfs wel de oorzaak van die segregatie, doordat we het zo lang niet willen zien. Dat dat erbij hoort. Die talen horen erbij. We hebben de, uh, de conventie de rechten van het kind natuurlijk, die al in 1989 zijn geformuleerd en in 1990 door Nederland zijn geratificeerd. Uh, de Raad van Europa en ook de EU hebben al heel erg lang een taalbeleid, 1 plus 2 wordt dat genoemd. En dan zijn er allerlei wetten binnen het Nederlandse uh, systeem die ook uh, dat allemaal eigenlijk toelaten en het gewoon direct benoemen. Dit is uh, artikel 29 van de uh, kinderrechten, rechten van het kind, doel van het onderwijs. Uh, zo meteen komt de Engelse, die laat ik eventjes hier zien. Um, zo volledig mogelijk de ontplooiing van het, uh, van het kind meenemen in het onderwijs. En dat, daar moet het onderwijs aan het kind op gericht zijn. En ook het bijbrengen van eerbied uh, voor de ouders van het kind en, enzovoort enzovoort. Culturele identiteit, taal. Uh, dat zien we hier ook. Dus daarin staat het, en dat heeft Nederland en heel veel andere landen hebben die um, kinderrechten al lang um, onderstreept. Uh, Raad van Europa en het 1 plus 2 beleid zegt, uh, 1 staat eigenlijk voor moedertaal en 2 staat voor twee andere talen. Aan het eind van je middelbare school, als je 16 bent, 17, 18 jaar, zorg dan dat iedere Europese burger uh, minimaal drie talen tot zijn beschikking heeft. Hoeft niet allemaal op het hetzelfde hoogste niveau te zijn um, en aanvankelijk uh, werd onder die moedertaal vooral of die eerste werd vooral de nationale taal gezien. We dachten allemaal moedertaal dat is Nederlands toch voor iedereen. Nou nee, er kwamen natuurlijk een hele hoop regionale groepen uh, in opstand. De, de, uit uh, Bretagne, de, de, de Bretonners of de Sardijnen of de Basken die allemaal zeiden oh, of de Friesen natuurlijk. Um, wij, hebben ook, uh, wij hebben ook een uh, moedertaal en die is niet het Nederlands. En die taal moet ook een plek uh, krijgen. En dan was er natuurlijk ook nog een lingua franca die van ons, ontzettend belangrijk is, zoals het Engels of het Frans of het Duits of Spaans. Um, inmiddels uh, zegt Europa nu zelf ook, die één, ja dat is wel degelijk de moedertaal. Dat moet echt voor iedereen de moedertaal zijn, ook voor migranten die van buiten Europa komen. Uh, laat die taal ook door het onderwijs en in het onderwijs een plek krijgen en meetellen. Wat wij nu zeggen het is 2 plus 1, de nationale taal in ieder geval. Zo die naar Franca is ontzettend belangrijk. Maar laat verder het ook aan leerlingen en ouders zelf om te kiezen welke derde taal, minimaal weer steeds, uh, erbij moet komen. Uh, primair onderwijs, de wet op het primair onderwijs, Nederlandse wetgeving, uh, laat dit eigenlijk toe. Artikel 9, inhoud van het onderwijs zegt, ja zeker, Nederlands taal, natuurlijk, vanzelfsprekend. Engelse taal, zeggen ze. Er kan ook, hè, sinds kort kan ook Duits of Frans op bepaalde scholen uh, gegeven worden. Um, en het Fries uh, kan dus ook, dat zijn in ieder 
van in het basisonderwijs al vier talen die met name uh, genoemd worden. Maar lid 13 van, die, van datzelfde artikel zegt ook, ik kijk eventjes naar de onderstreping, die komt van mij, voor de opvang en in- en aansluiting bij het Nederlandse onderwijs van leerlingen met een niet-Nederlandse culturele achtergrond, kan de taal van het land van oorsprong mede als voertaal bij het onderwijs worden gebruikt. En daar staat nog bij, overeenkomt er een door bevoegd gezag vastgestelde gedragscode. Daar kom ik later nog even op terug in de vertaling in het Engels, ziet u nou onder staan. Um, er in, uh, het wet, uh, op het voortgezet onderwijs is er een vergelijkbaar artikel, 6a, is dat um, het onderwijs wordt, uh, de examens worden afgenomen in het Nederlands. In afwijking van de eerste volzin kan een andere taal uh, worden gebezigd. Natuurlijk als het onderwijs betreft in Frans bijvoorbeeld, of Duits, die taal. Uh, of B, indien die de specifieke aard, de inrichting of de kwaliteit van het onderwijs dan wel de herkomst van de deelnemers daartoe noodzaakt. Um, dus dit staat er. En dit staat er niet uh, sinds gisteren. Dit staat er al uh, zeker sinds uh, halverwege uh, jaren 2000. Misschien wel vanaf het moment dat OWALT eigenlijk ongeveer werd afgeschaft. Dat dit wel al in de wet gewoon opgenomen staat. Er is geen enkele reden meer voor de school om te zeggen, wij laten deze taal niet toe. Huh? Of hier spreken we alleen maar Nederlands. En die thuistaal, die moet je zelf maar thuis gebruiken. Uh, er is ook nog eens een keer uh, aparte wetgeving over de onderwijsachterstanden. Dus er zijn beleid op gemaakt, de bestrijding ook van taalachterstand. Daar wordt uh, uh, begrijpelijkerwijs het recht ook specifiek gewezen naar de beheersing van het Nederlands. Uh, maar intussen als taalkundige weten we heel erg goed dat als je die andere talen van leerlingen niet meeneemt in, de hele, in het hele onderwijs, in dat leren van het Nederlands ook, uh, dan mis je een groot deel. Dus eigenlijk op grond van deze wetgeving zou je ook al zeggen, het bestrijden van achterstanden, in het bijzonder van de beheersing van het Nederlands, daarvoor heb je die andere talen en die thuistalen ook echt nodig. Nou, waar hebben we het over als we nou kijken naar die thuistalen, die home languages, in de basisschool en in het uh, voortgezet onderwijs. Daar zit natuurlijk een verschil. In de basisschool en in het uh, voortgezet onderwijs, hebben we net gezien, heb beide, al die talen mogen in feite allemaal als onderwijstaal gebruikt worden. Hè, als dat nodig is. Nou, dat is wel heel goed om te weten. Dat is dus eigenlijk de docent zelf of een aanvullende docent die die taal beheerst, die zou je dus kunnen inzetten. Uh, de taal kan sowieso al, ook uh, als uh, communicatietaal, hè, als voertaal, zou je hem dus uh, in ieder geval ook willen uh, toelaten. Uh, en heel erg belangrijk is dat je kinderen, ook zeker in de basisschool, die taal, die eigen taal, laat gebruiken naast het Nederlands in het hele denk- en leerproces. En dat kan op heel veel verschillende manieren. Daar gaan we ook vast uh, voorbeelden nog van zien, zometeen. In uh, het voortgezet onderwijs speelt natuurlijk dat je ook nog de taal als schooltaal of als vak zou kunnen doen. En daar uh, je verder in kunt uh, ontwikkelen. En daar eindexamen in gaan doen. Um, het wet op het voortgezet onderwijs, artikel 13, zegt daar ook over. Dit gaat even heel specifiek over het atheneum. Dus, uh, niet over het gymnasium, omdat je daar Latijn en Grieks hebt. Maar op het atheneum in het voortgezet um, onderwijs... Um, kan, uh, dat is uh, artikel 1, sectie, uh, lid 1, sectie C, een andere moderne vreemde taal en literatuur bij algemene maatregelen van bestuur aan te wijzen, enzovoort. Maar dat kan dus. En dan ook nog ter keuze van de leerling. Het is heel belangrijk om dit te weten. Dit staat in de wet. Voortgezet onderwijs atheneum in dit geval. Er is ook een inrichtingsbesluit, een regulation, een specifieke... Uh, inrichting van die wetgeving. Die moet je er echt naast leggen en bijnemen om te weten wat er nou precies in het uh, voortgezet onderwijs allemaal kan en mag. Dit gaat even over de eerste drie leerjaren VWO en HAVO. Het is, uh, dat kan ik wel zeggen, een enorme klus om door die wet heen te gaan en ook dat inrichtingsbesluit en om precies te voelen en te zien waar, wat de mogelijkheden zijn. Um, je zou bijna denken dat het met opzet gedaan is om het ons allemaal heel lastig te maken. Ook de scholen en de schooldirecteuren heel lastig te maken. In ieder geval staat hierover. Um, 
het onderwijsprogramma de eerste drie leerjaren aan een school voor VWO en een school voor HAVO omvat tevens onderwijs in de Franse taal en Duitse taal. Dus naast het Nederlands en het Engels als verplichte talen. Uh, maar het bevoegd gezet kan een leerling van een school, als een, hè, enzovoort, enzovoort, indien de leerling onderwijs volgt in de Spaanse, Russische, Italiaanse, Arabische, Turkse taal of uh, VWO ook Chinees. Dus dit is even heel erg belangrijk om te weten. Sowieso kunnen deze talen, waar aparte programma's voor ontwikkeld zijn, kunnen dus uh, geleerd worden. Um, je moet wel van alles doen daarvoor. Namelijk nou, ontheffing moet er verleend worden aan de leerling of leerlingen. In het inrichtingsbesluit um, gaat dit even over het gemeenschappelijk deel van het profiel. Dan hebben we het dus over het bovenbouw. Uh, van het voortgezet onderwijs. Nou, daar wordt het ook weer even genoemd, de keus van de leerling. Voor zover bevoegd gezag deze vak aanbiedt. Een tijdje geleden stond ik in pak, Pakhuizen Zwijger en heb ik ook uh, uh, hierover gesproken. En, uh, de wethouder was erbij, Marjolein Moorman. En ik vroeg ook even aan het publiek of men wist wie of wat het bevoegd gezag was. En uh, dat bleek een heel erg lastige vraag te zijn. Ook de wethouder liet meteen weten dat zij niet wist wie of wat het bevoegd gezag was. Dus dat uh, was wel sp ah, spannend eigenlijk. Um, maar waar hebben we het over als we dit eigenlijk allemaal uh, voor elkaar willen krijgen? Als we dus inderdaad die talen, veel meer talen in dat onderwijs een plek willen geven. Wat dus feitelijk kan en wat feitelijk mag. Maar we zullen er van alles voor moeten doen. Uh, je hebt de ouders, hè? als we kijken naar de actoren even, dan gaat het over ouders. En dan bijvoorbeeld een ouderraad op een school is daar belangrijk bij. We hebben een medezeggenschapsraad. Die medezeggenschapsraad bestaat uit een delegatie van ouders en van de personeel, de staf van de school. Heel erg belangrijk, een directeur van de school zit daar natuurlijk vaak bij ook. Uh, die medezeggenschapsraad heeft veel te zeggen. Die moet ook instemmen met allerlei nieuwe voorstellen, onderwijsvoorstellen. De schooldirecteur zelf is natuurlijk van groot belang en dat... Bevoegd gezag, dat bestuur. Meestal is dat dus een bestuur, bestuur, college van bestuur, waar allerlei scholen van verenigingen of een stichting waar allerlei scholen onder vallen. De gemeente is ook, zeker als het gaat om onderwijsachterstandenbeleid, dat is een gemeentelijke kwestie en daar moet je eens bij de gemeente zijn. Wat heb je verder nodig? Wil je die stap kunnen zetten, moet je natuurlijk als groep, en dat kan een specifieke groep van ouders zijn die specifieke taal vertegenwoordigen, maar het kunnen ook alle ouders zijn die kinderen hebben met een andere uh, taal die thuis gesproken wordt. Je moet zorgen dat je een soort inventarisatie maakt. Je moet natuurlijk plannen maken. En je moet dan een vriendelijk verzoek indienen uh, bij de school. Um, en van daaruit kan natuurlijk op een gegeven moment uh, een taalbeleidsplan ontwikkeld gaan worden. Als het goed is, heeft elke school een taalbeleidsplan. Vraag daar eens naar, kijk daar naar. Uh, maar misschien staat er helemaal niets over die thuistalen in. Dus dat is een belangrijk punt. Die gedragscode laat ik even met rust nu. Een maatregel van bestuur is uiteindelijk wat op, uh, op het hoogste niveau in Den Haag zeg maar, uh, plaatsvindt. Uh, om te zeggen of echt in Swahili of in het Pools eindexamen gedaan kan worden, uh, dan moet je toch nog weer uh, in Den Haag zijn. Maar het kan. De ruimte is er in principe wel. We hebben dit afgelopen jaren, dit is nou een mooi voorbeeld, deze pilot van de Esprit scholen is een bestuur geweest hier in Amsterdam dat ook echt heeft gezegd, laten wij nou eens veel meer talen toelaten. Laten we in ieder geval die talen waar eindexamenprogramma's voor ontwikkeld worden, uh, aan de leerlingen aanbieden. Dat gebeurde weliswaar nog uh, buiten de reguliere tijden. Het was geen officieel vak op school, maar het is wel gedaan. En daar hebben in die twee jaar bijna 450 leerlingen aan meegedaan. Die acht talen, ook Frans en Duits, hebben we aangeboden. Want ook op allerlei scholen, VMBO-scholen bijvoorbeeld, kwamen opeens ook allerlei leerlingen die Frans wouden leren of Duits wouden leren. Uh, of op andere plekken ook leerlingen die die taal hadden laten vallen en dat later toch weer op wouden pakken. Nou, heel wat certificaten. En dan hebben ze een klein groepje leerlingen gehad die in het Turks en het Arabisch eindexamen hebben gedaan. Dat ze uh, uh, tot uh, een grote blijdschap en... Dat was natuurlijk hartstikke mooi dat ze dat op hun diploma uh, erbij konden zetten. Inmiddels hebben de stichting Taal naar Keuze opgericht. En uh, na de zomer zal het eerste uh, programma helemaal gaan draaien. Uh, daar kunnen scholen zich binnenkort voor gaan inschrijven. 
kunnen leerlingen aanmelden of hele klassen afnemen. Dat is ook mogelijk, maar zeker als het gaat om eindexamen leerlingen, dan kun je ook leerlingen in een, in een digitale klas plaatsen. Je hoeft niet zelf dat hele onderwijs uh, op jouw eigen school aan te bieden. We hebben een programma dat alle talen heet, dat gaat over uh, functioneel veel talen leren, over talensensibilisering, het gaat over een, uh, een taalvergelijkend uh, uh, zien wat, uh, wat taal eigenlijk allemaal is en wat taal doet een beetje. Daar zijn we ook op dit moment uh, op het Moenoes College mee bezig met uh, twee groepen nieuwkomersleerlingen. Uh, we hebben een uh, startersjaar, noemen we dat, voor, specifiek voor leerlingen in de onderbouw. Um, in ieder geval dus de, de talen uh, die ook uh, volgens het inrichtings, uh, inrichtingsbesluit ook kunnen, uh, worden daar startersjaar voor aangeboden. We werken zo dat een hele onderbouw daar mee kan doen. Dus als je uh, de donderdagmiddag gebruikt bijvoorbeeld, of de woensdagochtend, doet het een dagdeel om andere taalvakken aan te bieden, dan kun je leerlingen in de hele onderbouw laten kiezen. En uh, ja, laat ze het maar doen. En dan krijg je 12-jarigen en 14-jarigen bij elkaar. We hebben ook uh, VBO'ers en gymnasiasten bij elkaar in de groep gehad. We hadden uh, moedertaalsprekers en beginners van talen bij elkaar in de klas. En dat gaf eigenlijk een, een heel mooi effect. Nello kan daar nog iets over vertellen, die als docent Italiaans heeft meegewerkt daaraan. Um, we hebben uh, het programma dat we na de zomer gaan aanbieden, wat we ook nu uh, in, in het klein aan het doen zijn op Denise, een andere Esprit school, is het examenprogramma. Twee jaar lang zorgen dat je leerlingen dus die, die taal al goed beheersen. Het hoeven niet altijd per se moedertaalsprekers te zijn, maar in ieder geval leerlingen die die taal al op een hoog niveau beheersen. Die kunnen we begeleiden om te zorgen dat ze dat examenprogramma doen. Nou, Joop Denise bijvoorbeeld hebben we eerst gisteren net uh, met een klein groepje leerlingen het schoolexamen Spaans afgenomen. Die leerlingen zitten eigenlijk op een VBO niveau, maar hebben nu... Het examen Spaans op HAVO-niveau gedaan. En daar uh, hadden we ook een zeer ervaren uh, docent Spaans uit Breda was overgekomen om dat allemaal in de gaten te houden en goed te meten. En die zei ook, deze leerlingen krijgen een tien van mij. Allemaal krijgen ze een tien. Dus dat is die waren super blij. Um, er zijn uh, natuurlijk allerlei materialen al ontwikkeld die hierover gaan. Um, die zitten dus in deze powerpoint. Ik ga ze niet nu bespreken, want ik denk dat mijn tijd ook wel bijna op is. Hè? Ja, je hebt het ook klaar. Ik ga eindig eigenlijk even met twee dingen die wij nog uh, hebben gedaan. Uh, wij hebben blueprints gemaakt, een blauwdruk voor zo'n vriendelijk verzoek. Die heb ik uh, bij me. Een paar heb ik uh, gekopieerd ook, maar die kunnen zeker daarna ook uh, online uh, gedeeld worden. Eigenlijk om dus als groep ouders, wij ouders van leerlingen die thuis een andere taal spreken dan het Nederlands enzovoort enzovoort. Maar vragen u dus om deze talen uh, vooral toe te laten in de school. En uh, leerlingen dus ook uh, de ruimte te geven om dat hele talenrepertoire dat ze hebben uh, in te zetten. Daarin, dit is maar een klein stukje van die blueprint. Ik ga hem niet verder uh, geven nu. Maar we hebben eentje voor het basisonderwijs en een voor het voortgezet onderwijs met kleine fragmentjes ook van de wetgeving die daar specifiek naar, naar verwijzen. In de hoop dat jullie dat kunnen gaan gebruiken en inzetten om zo schooldirecteuren, maar zeker dus ook, doe dat ook absoluut via zo'n oude raad en via zo'n medezeggenschapsraad, om te zorgen dat mensen er gevoel bij gaan krijgen en dat ze uiteindelijk via die weg komt bij dat bevoegd gezag, namelijk dat bestuur, die moet het ermee eens zijn. En soms moet het nog verder naar boven toe, uh, misschien via de wethouder, maar anders toch eigenlijk direct via OCMB of uh, de onderwijsinspectie om het uh, op een hoger niveau te krijgen. Ja, dat was het. Dank je. So um, actually this was more the part of law in Holland and the possibilities. Um, is there anybody who has a question about what was being told? Of course, she will be here afterwards, but maybe for now. Is there anybody? Yes. Do you want me to do with an English or? Oh, oh whatever. Oh, whatever. Yeah. Okay, Carlijn, thank you very much for your speech. We, we know each other very well. Um, oh, 
I have a particular question. If you are learning your mother language uh, properly, uh, so to say, does it improve your IQ? <laughs> uh, I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I don't know, but uh, I'm, I'm not a researcher, uh, and, and I'm, I don't know exactly if it has been measured. Maybe Marina can can talk about it. But uh, what we know is that it improves you your executive functions and uh, the whole cognitive uh, uh, level of, of, of students. Um, their ways of presentation will improve, uh, they feel more comfortable, more secure. Um, so there are many, many reasons uh, to, to allow them to, to, to develop their own languages. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think later on we'll have more questions about this part. Thank you very much. Thank you. More applause. Huh? So at least we know that we, there are possibilities to implement different language educations uh, in the Dutch school system. And um, so, and, and now, now we are going to listen <laughs> from, uh, to Marinelle who just arrived from Paris. And um, very welcome. And uh, she has written different books. You probably, you might know her name uh, about uh, uh, different books about multilingualism, uh, about and for children as well. Yes. Yes. yes for and, children. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so nice. And Marinetta. Mm -hmm. Marinetta is uh, Dutch, yes. uh, but also Italian. Also Italian. Yes. yes. And uh, she's mother of two trilingual kids. Yes. So that's Italian, Dutch, Dutch and French because I come from Paris now, so I live in Paris. Yeah. Yeah. And um, she has a passion for language in general, yes. but for bilingualism in specific. Yes. After your master's degree uh, um, in Dutch, uh, you were working as a Dutch teacher mm -hmm. at the Université Lille 3. Yeah, Lille 3. Yeah, yeah. d'accord. And the Institut Néerlandais. Yeah. Correct. Uh, at Paris, where she always, uh, where she also taught multilingual children. Uh, besides her writing, she's nowadays very much uh, involved in lectures, workshops about multilingualism and interculturality. Yes. Well. So those two are going together. They are going together. Of yes. Of course. Almost. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Not always, because sometimes you have one culture you speak two languages, but generally they go together. Yes. Yeah. And um, and and how is it? Um, because you have two children who speak three different languages. Yes. Uh, they are the future. Is, yeah. is, is that is that where your passion for this? Yeah, from? but I think it came from in the beginning it came from my own mm -hmm. uh, monolingualism <laughs> because uh, like you I have an Italian father, I was born in Holland and in that time they, they said it's better not to, to talk Italian <laughs> so my father always spoke Dutch to me so I was raised monolingual and I always missed the Italian language I think that it already began there my passion, the passion. for yes. Yeah. so I learned Italian afterwards then I went to, well, to, to Paris, so I, well, daily I speak three languages, now I try to speak English, that's the fourth. I had to sit down for the fifth, I studied uh, German, but I don't uh, speak that very well now. Um, but I think it started already there. Yeah. I didn't know that at the time. Often now, happens, afterwards you realize, yes, okay, that, now that I was realize this whole uh, parkour. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm very curious, and I think we all are about your story, so yeah. go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, for the future, for this international future, is to, so, to change the whole society's monolingual mindset yeah, into a multilingual vision. So, I don't know if it's very ambitious, but I think it's important. So, oh no, I, um, I go back because, well, uh, we start with the mother tongue because, um, well, uh, Bojena told us it was the, uh, the international uh, mother tongue day, and the idea for this. Uh, for this evening was also the mother tongue, so I would like to, to start with the importance of the mother tongue and what about the father tongue, but so I will explain that a little bit later. It's a very important topic in this international world because it emphasizes the, yeah, the importance of the heritage language, but sometimes it's confusing 
when they ask you, but what is your real mother tongue? Or maybe without real, what is your mother tongue? That's maybe an, an, an easy, an, an, yeah, an, not a difficult uh, question for monolinguals. They have one mother tongue, so well, it's Dutch, or it's Italian, or it's French, or it's, I don't know. But what if you are raised multilingual, and they ask you, what is your mother tongue? Then you have to make a choice. Do you, and there is, the worst for a multilingual is to have to choose between two or three languages. So it's a very bad question. Even if it's always, um, they, they, they ask you it with interest for you, of course. So it comes from, for a good, uh, for something good turns into something bad because you have to make a choice. And that's not necessary because we have to embrace all the languages and all the cultures, not one. So the mother tongue. Um, the thing is that there is no choice because if you raise bilingual, you have two or trilingual, you have three mother tongues. In the Dikke van Dalen is written that the mother tongue is the language in which you learned to speak. If you raised bilingual, you have you learn to speak in two languages or maybe in three languages. Um, if you're by, it's always also the language in which you feel, uh, in which you can express the best way your emotions. And the people, if I ask something, what is mother tongue? They say that's, uh, I can get angry in that language or I can express my emotions in the language we talked about it. So, and but someone who grew up with two languages, they get angry in two languages. My daughter never gets angry with me in French because she knows that I don't listen, I don't, I don't react. And at school, if she gets angry in Dutch, people look very astonished at her. So she gets angry in different languages. It depends on the person huh, who she speaks with. So they are their very selves in different languages. So they have two or three mother tongues. But that's a little bit strange <laughs> to have three more. I have, sometimes I have a little problem with the name mother tongue because it's the mother tongue for my children, Dutch, because I am their mother. And what is Italian? Is that their father tongue? But what is a father tongue? Uh, is that the mother tongue, their Italian? And what is French? Is that a school tongue or uh, a pear tongue? So I think in this new, inter of new in this international world, that maybe it's better to speak about basic languages. It's your basic, and from this base you you develop yourself. It's less maybe less emotional because mother. That's something special. But maybe it's it is more easy to understand also for monolinguals that your base can be one language, can be two, can be three languages. Okay, and there's not three mothers or three mother tongues. So that's what I want to propose for, uh, for the future. Uh, I don't know if UNESCO agrees with me, but maybe it, it's, it's a new idea. Okay. Um, then um, I would like to talk about the role of languages for multilinguals. Um, of course, I yeah, I mentioned again mother tongue here, just to to make slowly the the step into basic language. Then we have the school language and the home language. These are the three kinds of languages multilinguals uh, deal with. Uh, very often, one language can be, of course, the three. Sometimes only two. It depends on the each language situation at home. For example. Uh, at my home, the mother tongue of, uh, of the basic language Dutch and Italian are both basic language and home languages. French is the school language and also the basic language. In other families it's different, but it's very important to uh, really understand these different uh, names because we use it very often and it's not always clear what is a school language and a home language. If you just have, I don't know, uh, a Polish mother and maybe a Dutch father. You have your Dutch is 
mother tongue is school language and home language, okay? So they are interacting. Why is that so um, important to organize all these languages? Because uh, all these different languages are really part of the child. Um, and we cannot uh, deny one of them. Uh, Karin also told that it's important to consider it always their heritage, language and culture. If we only judge them for their Dutch, we just take into account a part of the child. And that's what we often do because that's what we can see. We don't see the other part of the child. But we have to learn to look also at the other part of the child. Um, there is a lot of importance uh, nowadays about the school language and that is very logical, that has always been like that and that's important. Um, but Caroline told us, so I will not talk too long about that. The uh, home language is really important and not, you can maybe not speak it, or, but in, you have to know that it, for the person it's really important. Um, and the question about the IQ, I don't know if it's the IQ is, is, is changing with the language, but for both languages, if you are good in one language, you also have a good level in the other language. If you have a very low level in one language, you also have it in the other one. They are always together. So if you pay a lot of attention to one language, it helps for both languages. And then we are just talking about languages. We don't even talk about the construction of the person itself. It's very important for multilingual children, and I think Bose and I told it in the beginning, to be proud of all the parts in you, so of your Dutch part, but also of your Polish or your Italian or your whatever. You can, you can be proud of that part. A lot of uh, studies have done, been done by a uh, so, uh, uh, psychologist. Well, sorry for my English. <laughs> uh, and for the construction of a person, it's very important to consider all the languages and all the cultures. Otherwise, children have to choose. And again, when they have to make a choice, it's, it's, it's not possible. You cannot choose between your leg or your arm. And it's like this, okay? So you never have to, um, to, to force them to make a choice. Or you choose for your family, and then the society has the idea that you didn't choose for them. Or you choose for the society, which is a problem when you are at home. So the role of the languages are very important and to see it all, all together. Um, I would like to read a little piece of my book. I translated it myself in English, so sorry for the, for the quality. It is about the uh, language relation. For me, that's really the base of multilingualism. The language relation we have with, uh, with other persons. And it's about Aurora. She's trilingual, she speaks French with her mother, Italian with her father, and Dutch with her sisters. It's a little bit like my daughters, but then turned into another uh, combination. Aurora is shrugging her shoulders. She doesn't understand why people are so surprised when she says that she speaks French with her mother, Italian with her father, and Dutch with her sister. It's just so logical. My mother comes from France, my father from Italy, and my sister and I were born in the Netherlands. Furthermore, when my mom, that's how I call her, speak Dutch to me, sometimes she does, when my friends are at home, it seems like someone else is talking to me, and not my mom. <coughs> that's strange. The first day I went to school, I was so surprised that all other children spoke Dutch with their mother, their father and the teacher. That was new to me, and that was so weird. Okay, so we changed the visions here. Um, the language relation is for, I already told you, but it's really for me the basic. What happens? Multilinguals always have one to one language relations with the different people around them. 
For monolinguals, sometimes it's difficult to understand. Are there any monolinguals? I mean, <laughs> in the, I mean, like me, monolingual, that maybe you learned uh, no, no monolingual. So then I can explain to the multilinguals here in the audience that uh, um, for monolinguals, there, there, there were some. Yes, there were some. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Um, that uh, now I um, yeah for uh, for monolinguals it's very natural to have the same language relation with all the persons around them. When you have a Dutch mother and a Dutch father, you were born in the Netherlands and you just never met. I mean, you grow up with all Dutch speaking persons. Then for you it's logical that is that is one language and that is also the the basis for everything. And from that language, then maybe you learn other languages, but sometimes it's very difficult, so you remember it, that was hard. But for multilinguals, it's logical to have one to one language relations with all the people around you. And this is a huge difference, and I think that is one of the most difficult things for monolinguals to understand. So we as multilinguals, we also have to explain them. Um, we all know that when I give the example of a fruit, even before people, before children grow up, uh, and my daughter had an apple, I remember she was so little that she said, Mama, uh, apple, Papa, Mela, and, and uh, the, 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 the lady who worked at the crest, boom. I think that were, was, she was just so young, she didn't even know about languages, but for the, for, then it's so logical that uh, one object has three different names. Um, and we always have to explain this, I think, around us, also at school, because for them it's difficult to understand that, it's so, that we have all these uh, language relations with the persons around us, which are different. They think that it's that it costs us, um, how can I say, um, it's difficult for, for, for us to change the language, but that is so automatically. I always try to uh, make, um, for example, uh, for Dutch people, I say, yeah, but it's like you're not talking in the same way to your mother, or maybe to your neighbor, or to your children. Different ways of talking in one language. Sometimes that helps. Oké, zo hier de language relation. En uh, ik vind je geen mama als je Nederlands praat. My daughter told me that hey, when I speak French, sometimes I do when there are, an, uh, are maybe friends at home. And then I speak also French to her. And once she said me, ik vind jou geen mama als je, nee, als je, Frans, tegen mij, als je, nee, als je Frans tegen mij praat. Ja, ik heb het hier omge... Uh, I changed it here into Dutch because of my book, but it was a Dutch book, so that's why I changed the language, yeah? Maybe, um, and I always give monolinguals the exercise uh, just to understand, go at home and then talk another language with your husband or with your children, language that you both know, but you never talk in that language. Just try to speak another language. You will understand each other, but it's not the same feeling you have. And that is one of the most important things, the feeling you have with somebody. It's difficult to change also the language relation afterwards. Once you start to speak in a language, generally you continue that language. It's very strange to change that afterwards. I never speak Italian with my father. He's Italian, I speak very well Italian, but we always spoke Dutch, so it's very strange for us to talk together in Italian. Okay, then I want to talk about the language acquisition. Um, I just show you this very quick. Uh, oh, well, the PowerPoint. <laughs> so, uh, and please uh, keep it in mind for the next slide. So the pre-language states zero to one year. Then the babbling but starts about six, eight months. Early language from one year to two and a half years. One, they start with one word phrases, not two words, and then so on. Differentiation, more complicated phrases and more words. And then long, 
quiz condition from five years and onwards. I just said it very quickly to go to the multilingual multi language acquisition. Um, we have the simultaneous language acquisition and sequential language acquisition, and that's not the same. Eh? So sometimes we talk about multilingual children, but we also always have to divide them in different groups um, to understand how to, um, um, uh, also for school, school pro programs or other, it's not the same if we are in simultaneous situations or in sequential language situations. Um, what happens with bilingual first language acquisition? Tweetalige eerste taalverwerving. Um, children pass through all the different phases you just saw uh, in each language. So they really have uh, these different language uh, structures in their brain. Of course, they interact one to each other, but they are all basic language. Okay. The sequential language acquisition is always the early second language acquisition, vroege tweede taalverwerving. Children pass through all the different phases in their basic language, and then, depends on the age, they start new to learn the second language, Dutch in this case, when they come to Holland. Of course, they don't start bubbling again uh, at six or seven years. Eh? They just skip the, the first two phases and directly start with the third or the fourth phases. Okay? This results in one language system in their brain from which they have only one basic language and from which they learn the new language. So that's why it's so important to pay always a lot of attention to the other languages. In the first case, because it's just part of you, you cannot uh, take one language away or not develop it anymore. Eh? Because there is nothing... Um, um, it's uh, so bad that if you have... Um, you speak one language and you cannot... Uh, your vocabulary is maybe for eight years old, but you are, you are only 12 or 15 years old. Then you cannot express yourself anymore. So it's very important uh, to always to, to, to continue to feed that language. You cannot stop at once because then you just lose them. It's not, you, you feel it no longer yours. And of course, in the set for the second group, so the sequential language uh, acquisition, if you don't continue with your first language, your basic language, then you have no base for the second one. And then you won't, it's difficult for you to learn it. Uh, your base is unstable. And then it's very bad for both languages. And it's possible that it happens during uh, different, uh, a lot of years now that people were not allowed to pay attention to their home language and that's not, uh, maybe, uh, I, we don't have uh, results, uh, research results for that, but it is possible that the taalachterstand about we talk a lot is due to that because they had, didn't have the possibility to talk the um, the home language at home, they were not encouraged to do it. And then uh, the, the children came with a very poor Dutch level in the schools. It is possible. Then I would like to talk about the uh, vocabulary just, and I would like to read again a little piece of my book about the vergiet. Yeah? What is a vergiet? You really don't know what it means, says Elisa, surprised when Evelyn has no clue about the meaning of vergiet. Please explain, Evelyn, suggests the teacher. Um, it's a thing with holes and you put salad in it so, and so the water can drip off. Ah, okay, I understand, says Evelyn. You can also use it for fruit and for pasta, says Aurora. Who never heard the word vergiet before, but knows the object very well. Well, you maybe all know the word vergiet. I don't know the level of Dutch. But if you, um, it's a colander, hey? you see it on top of there. Um, how important is it 
to know every word in every language. People very often ask, but if you're, if you're really uh, bilingual or trilingual and you know as many words and in each language, but that's not important. Huh? Um, sometimes people say they know more words, sometimes they say they know less word monolinguals. It is that they know much more words, um, uh, sorry, uh, multilinguals. Multilinguals know much more words than monolinguals, but less in each language. And that's also logical because uh, that's why they are also multilingual. So, uh, you have things you discuss at school and you think you discuss at home and you cannot have the same vocabulary uh, in every language. Important is of course to have a large vocabulary, but more important is to have a, not, a large knowledge. And vocabulary is knowledge. If you, you have input in your home language, in the school language, in another language, all languages input. What I tell you today in, in English, uh, I could have told it you better in Dutch, but <laughs> fine. But I mean, you can just, at home, the knowledge you have, you can just have output in another language. And I think sometimes that what miss at school, we always judge them, the, the bilinguals, um, because of the fact that they know less words. And maybe you recognize that I look at your son, uh, Rosanna. Uh, at school you know less words in Dutch. When you go to your family you know less words in that language, so sometimes even multilinguals they have the, I have the idea that they know less words. Do you recognize that or not? Yeah, I see some yes and yeah. And that's frustrating for everybody, but especially for multilinguals, but also for monolinguals, because they think you know always less. And then they say, and maybe you can try to explain, then they say, but we, we, we don't mind about that, uh, we don't care about the other language you speak, because we are in Holland. But uh, we have to take, of course, into account the whole knowledge of a child, and not only the words he knows in one or other language. And uh, that is a real uh, huge uh, step to make uh, for me to uh, this mon uh, multilingual vision. Of course, uh, schools they have to deal with it. Um, they think that the children that, that they cannot follow all the lessons because they don't have all the words. But then you can just uh, help them a little bit, maybe with a pictogram or maybe with saying the word, if it's possible, in the right language, just to activate the knowledge in their brain. Um, that's uh, all uh, input, uh, vocabulary input is knowledge, and that is the most important we can give our children. Was I not told it? Um, I, I, only in my own language, he said, I can really express myself the best way and give the maximum to our children. And that is very important for the knowledge of the children. Then I, because I think I'm also, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, uh, I would, would like to uh, uh, conclude that the multilinguals so are not the sum of two monolinguals, they have their own multi-competent knowledge, which cannot be erased within monolingual guidelines. I just gave you some little examples to show that. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Because at a short moment here, the, you said you were monolingual, but I mean, <laughs> not anymore. Explain. Well, I'm Dutch. Both of my parents were Dutch, so I feel monolingual. Yeah. But my children are bilingual. They are bilingual. Because my wife is Polish. Okay. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. Thank you. Marzena. Well, I just had the one remark, actually, not a question about the mother language and the father language, because depending on which language you are in Polish, actually, the mother language is not a mother language, but it's a father language. Język It's sort of becoming from the land, 
it's a land language. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Not, uh, not uh, yeah, it's fatherland. Yeah, 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 it's fatherland. So, yeah. It's, it's so you don't call it mother language. No, no, no. We call it the father. We call it the fatherland. Yeah, fatherland. Yeah. fatherland style. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I think it's be, it, it's even better so to take away mother or father because then there is always that kind of. But it's interest, interesting that you have another name for it. Yeah. Anybody else? Any, any questions for Marina? Yes. Okay, thank you very much for your speech. I, I really enjoyed it. I learned also a lot. I have a very practical question. Yeah. And my question is, I do have a Turkish family. Yes. She speaks uh, Dutch. She learned that later. Uh, she, uh, your, she, your wife? Your, no. no. It's not my wife. No. no, no. Okay. But so okay. we accept that we are family. Yes. Yes. Um, she speaks very... Uh, she's Turkish. Speaks Turkish and speaks also Dutch. He doesn't speak uh, Dutch very well, mm -hmm. very lousy, I would say. Uh, so, uh, they got a child, one, one year and a bit more. Yes. And the key question is, should she uh, read also at home? Uh, her kid, her boy, Dennis Arnas, uh, should she read him uh, books in Dutch and not only in Turkish? She, she's able to. She's able to. Since you're an expert in, yes. in, in, in these but matters, I, I thought yeah. I, I can raise this question here. Yes, yes, it's a very nice question, yeah. which I always suggest is to read most, to talk, of course, in Turkish, to read a lot in Turkish, but if, for example, school gives you a book to look together in Dutch, you can just take a moment together and read a book in Dutch. But I won't make the mistake only reading in Dutch. It's very important that she also reads in Turkish. Yeah, but it's not a problem if she opens a book and, and looks at it in, in Dutch. Maybe it's sometimes it's also nice because then we discover that the children are more capable in maybe in Dutch than you are. At least they don't have the accent. And it's very interesting to, for them to know that they are better in Dutch without accents than, for example, their mother. That's also interesting. But you can take it as a little moment, uh, a little touch moment, yeah. But always continue to read and to, of course, to talk also in your home language, yeah. Any more? Yes. I'll throw it again. <laughs> Um, I was very interested to hear your comments about the age and development of language. Yeah. I wonder if you have experience from the child's point of view when their prime language changes with their age. And my son, for instance, when he was two years old, he could only speak English and Polish. But then he went to school and at first he went to preschool, he learned Dutch. We were very careful not to speak Dutch with him. At home, yeah. And um, when he went to primary school, he was five or six years old, and he only spoke Dutch to us. So that was very emotional for us. And then we had to sit down and say, what is important for us? Yeah. Is it important to communicate with our child, or is it important that he speaks my language? And we chose to accept that he spoke to us in Dutch. Yeah. But then he was a bit older, and suddenly he woke and he thought, hey, this is great, I can speak more languages. And then, yeah. Now he does that. Yeah, there are, there are different, uh, yeah, I always call it critical steps. Uh, and that's when they go to school, because then in one moment there is a lot of input in the other language. Uh, so the, this equilibrates the, the, the language system, till then it was clear. And then, it, uh, then there is another at six years when they go to middle school, and then there is another one later on. Um, it's, I think it's very important to uh, to always have the input in your language, but um, to develop this as well. And that's not always easy, because at home, sometimes we just speak about, yeah, like in monolingual families, about just the ruling things, and you don't always have time to, to go a little bit further, and then at four, uh, when they are four, they go to school, they have a lot of Dutch inputs, and then you realize that there is a, 
uh, um, how can I say, an, an, niet een evenwicht, I don't know now. There's no balance. There is no balance uh, between the languages. So it's not easy, but I always tried to, to figure out what I did at school and just to talk a little bit in Dutch with my children about that, uh, that subject. I'm, I'm also curious what happened then, because you said at a certain moment my son was only speaking Dutch to us. And were you speaking Dutch back or were you no, speaking no, we, English we back? we continue to speak Did English you? and Polish and he, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he, I think the key emotional point for us was accepting that he would reply in Dutch. Yeah. Mm. And I think that's very important that we right. have that. Right. And you accepted it, said, in the end of... Yes, yes, you did, yeah. it was the most important that he should be able to express himself in the language that was most comfortable for him. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, yeah. And how old is he now? Okay. So, okay. <laughs> and that he, he speaks both languages now? No, yeah, really. so, yeah, of course, three because there is one. Okay, yeah. Because they're talking about you. Yeah, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Dit was een strikvraag. No, no, no. I didn't want to but then I realized, okay. Go ahead. What, what, do you, what are your thoughts about what, what's being well, said? For me, because I went to a Dutch primary school where I spoke Dutch for uh, seven, eight years, um, but then I switched to an international secondary school. Okay. Um, so, because I, I am trilingual, I speak three languages, but English and Dutch are both more dominant um, than Polish because I, I, I've been to school yes, in both yes, those yes. languages. Yeah, yeah. And so, I feel for me, English and Dutch are completely equal because I've been to school in both languages, I have friends in both languages, yeah. I sp I've spoken both those languages at home. So, for me, those are both mother tongues. And then Polish, not as much because. This is your, this is your mother. Yeah, it's, 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 um, and then Polish, not as much as because I've always spoken less Polish than English and Dutch, and it's also, I would say, ten times as more much complicated than Dutch and English combined. Yeah. <laughs> it's and I, I can agree because I was really practicing, and um, but but doesn't have to do with what you're used. To yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. If you're used to certain sounds and words, then it's easier. Yeah. But it's it's still nice to to to, to hear this, right? Yeah. To and, and 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 you're one of the examples, and, and I'm sure there are coming much more children like that who at least have two uh, yeah. Um, yeah. languages that they speak equally, you know. Yeah. So, but I don't. I just would like to say that. The fact that you speak one language more, or you feel more comfortable, less comfortable, it doesn't take anything away from the feeling that it's mm -hmm. uh, a mother tongue or a basic language. It's it's always part of you, yeah, no, and uh, the balance changes. You 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 well, you gave the example with ages. It changes and. It is always part of you, so uh, and that's and important. So it has you to stay part of you. That. Yeah. yeah, good. Somebody next to you, go ahead. Hi. Um, I have a comment and a question actually, because uh, uh, Caroline talked about uh, law, and you were talking about uh, growing up in a multilingual family, but nobody is mentioning the role of the partner, how important it is that the partners knows both languages. Yeah. I, my husband learned, learned Polish, he is fluent in Polish, and I don't... And where is he from? Uh, he's Dutch. Dutch. Yeah. But I don't have to, when I'm talking Polish to my children, I don't have to think about him, because I know he understands. At least he understands, it doesn't feel like... No, I mean, he, he speaks, but I mean, yeah. So it doesn't matter if you so speak I, your language with no. your children. So I don't have to be compromised, and I don't have to no. think which language use so he can understand as well. Yeah. I can just go ahead and um... That's comfortable. I agree that the role of the partner is very important. Uh, it's wonderful when they all, uh, speak the language. My husband doesn't speak Dutch, so uh, uh, but he supports the, whole, the the also because he also speaks his own language at home. So, but it's very important that this the support is there. I spoke a lot of families where the multilingual um, um, situation changed because one of the, the parents, they were jealous of when they were talking uh, another language, another home language. 
and so the the child had to had to um, hide it or and that's very complicated. And this is exactly then, what I'm talking about. Sorry, this is exactly what yes. I was talking about. And it's and the parents uh, play a role. Sorry, because there's, I know you have so there, there are a lot of things to say, but. Yeah, no, so there are the parents, but also the grandparents. I talked to a lot of families uh, in France, uh, and their grandparents, uh, the sort of friends' grandparents, find it a problem that they talk Dutch with the children because then they didn't understand it. So there are a lot of influences. Yeah, yeah. okay. And that's uh, very important. Yeah, very interesting. Um, uh, the last question, because afterwards we'll, we'll talk more. <laughs> As I I nobody sees. <laughs> uh, why don't you come down a little bit more? No, I'm sorry. I just uh, it's true. I didn't see you. <laughs> but you are. You can come a little bit uh, uh, together. There is somebody else that is going to ask. So I don't know whether I am also. I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you the turn, okay? And then we're going to continue because the thing is, there are more interesting <laughs> talks here that may maybe you know uh, give some answers as well. But go ahead. I'm sorry. So I was wondering. Uh, what do you think about passing on a, a second language or a home language to the next generation? Since I'm a multilingual yeah. child and I'm not planning on having baby babies yet, <laughs> but so just in case, like, I was raised in Holland, I went to school in Holland, yeah. so I spoke more Dutch yeah. than Italian, but still no. my Italian is good as yeah. well. So I, with, I, I think it would be a pity if my child wouldn't be raised. Yeah in Italian, but I didn't, well, I just went to Italy for four months, but it's yeah. not like I, I had other education no. in Italy. So. But I mean, you, you see the value yeah. of speaking more languages and you would love to give that yeah. path to your children, right? Yeah. That is, yeah. yeah. This is, so this is for my fourth book. <laughs> so, because the question raises so still have to every, wait. Yeah. So we are, I'm, I'm working a little bit on it. I don't have an answer now. It's a cliffhanger. <laughs> yes. But it's, it's really interesting because we have this whole new generation of mm -hmm. bi and trilingual children yes. who also want to give this present to their children. But what language they, they, they have to choose? My daughter also said, but I don't know which language I have to choose, Italian or Dutch or French. She said, maybe, well, let's depend it from the father. But, but it, it, I don't have a new question. Yes. Right. Yeah, but yeah. I, I am working on it. I'm trying to do the interviews because it's, it's a new thing and it's really interesting. Yeah, I don't think there is one single answer, but it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. Sorry that I don't have it yet, but uh, yeah, I'm working on it. It's very interesting, yeah. There you go. Hi, thank you. Hi. I'm uh, curious about your advice, how we can... I have a son, mm -hmm. he talks Ukrainian and Dutch, and he was at the first... He was at the start always talking Ukrainian to me. Yes. But I noticed indeed when he went to school, to Dutch school, he is changing. He is now, I mean, if he, his uh, grandmother coming, grandpa coming from Ukraine, then he talks Ukrainian to me as well. But then it changes backwards again and he starts talking Dutch again to me. Mm. So I'm trying to speak Ukrainian. I'm always talking to him in Ukrainian language, but he is answering. Dutch. Yeah. And sometimes when he needs something, then he uses it. Yeah. Language. Yeah. Language. Yeah. Language is very often. Yeah. What are the, yeah. Language is very often also a weapon. So <laughs> <laughs> it is, and children know that. So yeah, I all I always should suggest to really uh, try to let him talk in Ukrainian. Of course, it can turn uh, that then he speaks Polish in the end. But you, you always also heard a lot that uh, less Ukrainian he speaks, uh, more difficult it becomes to 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 stay at the right level for his age. Again, when you are 12 years old and you have a vocabulary for of a six-year-old child, then you give up. So or try automatically to invite him to uh, to talk Ukrainian or maybe explain him how important it is. And when if he needs something and he knows it, uh, he knows to talk in Ukrainian, he can do it. Sometimes it's also, also that it's more easy or faster or and it's important that he has the word so you 
you also have, have to give him the words yeah. uh, in because Ukrainian. Because he doesn't talk it that much, because yeah. every time less and less, then I notice that he's, uh, he's Ukrainian. Get yes, and that's a pity. So <laughs> it's important. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm very yeah. sorry. I know yeah. there's yeah. much more to say about yeah. it, and I really love it that you're that that so yeah. active, the public. But we really want to listen to the other uh, speakers. Marianne, thank, thank, thank you very much. One thing that we heard today is that, uh, for example, your example that my child is talking less and less Ukra Ukrainian and instead is talking more Dutch. Uh, here's the example that uh, maybe a little later the balance will come back and uh, just continue with the languages you have to offer. Um, and, but for now, and maybe she'll, she'll give us more insights about this topic. I think so. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Anna de Graaf. Uh, she's, uh, she has a master in linguistics and has over 15 years of experience and uh, as a linguist of which five years um, and, um, and as an education advisor in Amsterdam in the field of language stimulation and development of children. Well, Court. And uh, at this moment she works as a senior linguist uh, as, uh, at Meertalig.nl uh, where she is the contact person for local and international uh, investigators on the field of multilingualism and uh, she organizes workshops and seminars and advises on multilingualism. Last year she investigated the new development of the multilingual website of course, a website, yeah. we cannot forget about that, Languru, Languru where she contributed as a content developer. So, yeah, give us some insights. I hope I can give some insights because uh, where we had some interesting call, uh, call to action from uh, Marinella as well as Ferrein, uh, I will be um, taking the, the more the perspective of the parents because um, I work for Mirtalig.nl, uh, not a very Multilingual. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot all about. Did you Did you hear me at all? Did you prefer this? So you can move around. I forgot about. It. So, but you heard you heard what I said, right? Um, so now I'm going to take the parental point of view, or uh, as Mirtal Pentanel, which is not a very uh, multilingual or bilingual name, of course, um, but we're working on that. Um, um, we have this expertise or information center about uh, multilingualism or bilingualism. I will use probably use these terms interchangeably, but they refer to the same, essentially. Um, as uh, or Mietalig.nl, we are the uh, Dutch branch of the International Network of Bilingualism Matters, which is a a uh, whole network of people investigating multilingualism at different levels and we try to share this information with practitioners or parents or everybody having to deal with multilingualism in practice or with their children in this case and that's by means of workshops, readings, uh, a website that we have and social media. We also have a help desk for parents and professionals and I really recognize all these questions that I've just heard and uh, that's really nice. Uh, I love those stories. And um, we have been working on several projects with different partners as well uh, as the Forelays Express, which we'll see later on in uh, the form of Langaroo, the multilingual website. Uh, we've been working uh, in a European um, research project, Atheme, and uh, we have different parent programs such as Taal in Balance, Languages in Balance, how to keep those language balanced. <laughs> um, so that's about me uh, and our website. I wanted to let you know what it looks like. It has, uh, we put on blogs of experts in the field, but also like for instance Marinella, who will talk about her own experiences, but also their own uh, expertise. Uh, we have language tips, so what to do uh, if you want to stimulate one or the other language in the classroom or at home. Um, and all kinds of yeah, things about multilingualism. So, uh, we receive all kinds of questions and I deal with a lot of topics that have to deal with multilingual parenting or upbringing or how you call it. And I usually um, return these questions with these questions or this question, what do you want for your child? Because if you do not know that, um, then you also don't know 
how to deal with that. So if you only want to have it speak the language or uh, understand the language, there's less that you have to do, in fact. But if you want all these things for your child, to have him learn the language, read the language, and write the language, you know that you have to have some work to do. And you can have all kinds of different strategies to work on that. So this is always my answer, actually, like a counter question. Okay, so what do you want? So if your child only, uh, you know that he passively knows Ukrainian, but he doesn't speak to you in Ukrainian, you obviously want him to uh, be able to acti actively use your language as well. So how are, we, how are you going to tackle that? Okay. So you, well, I've heard a lot of languages here, but do you have any plans? Well, uh, I don't know if any, everybody has children or planning to have children, but does anybody have an idea of what, or already has uh, actively worked on that, of what he wants for their child? And is there a difference, like you wanted your child to speak the language but not write? Or does anybody have a, a could give me an example of that? There's a... Um, I'm a monolingual person. <laughs> I grew up with both Dutch uh, father and mother, and my children also uh, grow up with a Dutch. Uh, we do speak English. Uh, my boyfriend also has family in uh, America, so we, we talk as well. But my my children uh, grow up uh, with one language. Yeah. So it's very interesting for me. <laughs> Uh, that he now is a minority here in Amsterdam yeah. and in his school. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's very interesting. He learns English in school, of course, and he will learn Spanish, the third mother language, and he will be able to uh, choose from other languages to, to learn yeah, hopefully. in a secondary school. Yeah. yeah. He's uh, in one of the schools uh, uh, Caroline uh, is working on uh, mm -hmm. also. And my younger is. Uh, so it, it's interesting because. We we wanted to talk English at home, but it's not necessary because it's not our mother native, language. your native language, our uh, uh, yeah, our language of our heart. Yeah. <laughs> so which we can so you choose yeah. the best. So, so so you choose a language that you want him to learn. Or yeah, to and we decided to both stay speaking Dutch yeah. because he is bilingual. But yeah, you know that so he will get his language input from somewhere else. Well, he has to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want him to learn English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. But, but it's interesting, so sometimes now I think, hmm, is, is that the right way? Is he going to be a minority now? Yeah, so. yeah, that's a good question. But also, and for my youngest, it's very logical that uh, the children, when he comes in a home somewhere else, that they speak a different language. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting to see, I think, yeah. Is there another example of somebody yeah, who... Yeah, see up there. Up there. If you can throw it there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> My question is a little bit about um, the difference between uh, the emotion and the practical side of it. Because I'm Portuguese, my husband is Dutch, and we speak in English. And like it has been discu discussed already here, when you start a relationship in a language, you can't easily change it. <laughs> no. <laughs> we tried. <laughs> a lot. Um, so, I'm supposed to speak Portuguese with my children, he's going to speak Dutch, and we're going to speak English. But I also read you shouldn't speak another language that is not your mother language to your child because you're giving all the all the accent and all the, the mistakes you make, you're, you're passing it to them. Mm -hmm. How do I solve this problem? <laughs> <laughs> I, in the okay. same house, there are this is, one this is even like a step further already. So you've already decided uh, the, the languages that you want your child to learn, right? It's no, not really. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. I don't know English. But what do I do with this? <laughs> oh, oh, well, then I would first say, well, if you, <laughs> you probably would like to speak to your child in the language that lies nearest to your heart, right? And you both would like to do that. So that would be like the first thing. Yeah. And then you practically, because you also have a practical side of the whole issue, is that you have to find ways to deal with that in the home. So. If you both do not speak the languages uh, 
uh, you both your your native languages, then you have to have like a lingua franca between you. And if it's English, then that should be English. But then the the other question is like, what what do you want English to? Does your child also need to learn English from you, or how does he need to write it, or read it, or understand it, or? And then you can also say, well, if he, if I also want him to have English at a very high level, then I want to send him to school to learn it there, and not well. It's like this whole story, probably. Okay, can I get? But. Um, I was raising the hand also with a bit of similar question. Uh -huh. um, I am a bilingual Ukrainian-Russian. Yeah. My husband is bilingual Greek-Dutch. <laughs> Interesting. It's getting better. Yes. <laughs> we started in English with my husband. Um, we're 12 years further, two kids. Um, I kind of, for the kids, had to make a choice at some point to um, just quit several languages. Oh yeah. So I got rid of Russian completely because I had to make a choice for myself. <laughs> and um, for practical reasons, I kind of stopped communicating in English to have at least to go down to three. Yeah. Um, with one kid, we managed to have a separation. Me, Ukrainian, my husband, um, Greek, Dutch, because he couldn't make a choice. He grew up with two languages equally. Yeah. Um, with two kids, it became uh, more difficult because two of them spoke Dutch. <laughs> they just the kids get out of control, right? They yeah, I mean, they just made the choice also at some point. You know, what is easier is Dutch. Everyone that says Dutch will stick to that language. My husband keeps on speaking English to me, especially to hide stuff from the kids. Sure. Yeah. You need that language. Which at some point they started saying, eh, yeah, that what you said is not true. So we realized, okay, not same language anymore, they learned it. So still, we feel in a kind of language mess, to be honest. Yeah. Because none of the languages is good and really good by the kids. Um, we feel Dutch, uh, Greek, Ukrainian, English, but they just kind of go down, yeah. and I don't see a way to get it at least close to each other. Yeah. Because, I mean, how do you do that? Yeah, well, that, and that's exactly why I always ask these questions to get a clearer picture of see what which languages are in use in your family and what function do they have, what feeling do you have, what do you want with these languages and how do you continue with these languages because it's like it's not getting there uh, uh, naturally I mean it's not that you put a child in, in the world and you just talk to it and it gets this language I mean up to a certain level but if it's like this amount of languages it needs but I'll be talking about that later on it needs a certain amount of language input and if there's only one person speaking two, these two languages, the, the, in, the input is just too little to be able to stimulate this language up to a level that it can really develop. So that's, those are things that you have to keep in, your, keep in mind when thinking of which languages am I going to pass on to my children, which we, what is practically possible and what is, what is feasible and what, what should I aim for. But what, it what is on possible. every situation is every situation is different. <laughs> Can kids learn three languages at the same time? Can are the children able to learn three languages at the same time? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. school five, five, five when you're five. 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 Yeah. In the researches there's five languages. You just need time. Oh cool. <laughs> no, because we got already from school even message that try to speak more Dutch because the word no, 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 is then bad on the seat yeah. and I'm just like, uh, 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 excuse me, maybe you have to speak more of those words that the seat has. <laughs> this for him, I mean, this for him was on the seat and my kid didn't know that. Well, both of them, they didn't know for him and I'm just like, oh my God, I see it here again in presentation. Wow. <laughs> I, I don't remember talk, how we, it's called. I think we can talk about, we have a lot of to uh, things to talk yeah. about later on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think Thank so you for your story. Very, very nice and interesting. And also, that is how it is now. Yeah. Is we're globalizing, and these are the situations that are, that are existing. Mm -hmm. that yeah. are, uh, can, uh, 
Shall I Go just ahead. continue and we'll yeah. probably get to a lot of these issues as well because I wanted to well, present you with some things. <coughs> Short sure, quiz. I'm, I'm saying that it's a quiz, but it's not really a quiz. I want you to tell me whether it's true or false. And probably you're all experts, so you probably know it, but it's just to stimulate a, a discussion, perhaps, or thinking or thought or whatever. An easy one to start with. I usually ask this to, or pose this, what is it, proposition to uh, uh, parents as well as uh, professionals, and they. Well, you think, well, everybody who thinks that this is true, you may raise your hand. I often see that. <laughs> People raising their hands and then, oh, nobody's raising their hands. And uh, now, <laughs> or, uh -huh. okay, so I see Bojena, she said, well, yes, no, yes, no. So why do you say yes, no? Because actually, I had a well, the, he is the subject, he's sitting here, but what has happened <laughs> oh, yeah. actually at one point, um, we, we, when he was very little, we uh, went for the first time to Poland and suddenly the whole world was speaking Polish. He was used that the whole world speaks Dutch and at home is Polish and English and the whole world speaks Dutch. And went to Poland and he was kind of, oh wow, the whole world speaks Polish, that's mm -hmm. funny. And then within two weeks we went to England and then the whole world started to speak English and that was too much. He didn't take it. So he stopped speaking. He stopped speaking for several weeks, months. I was really scared what's going on, but he was sitting in the corners and practicing the sounds. So he was sitting and... So the brain, the brain yes. was working. He was bringing the structure. So that's why it's difficult to say, is it true or sure. is it false? Because yeah. you can make it a bit longer. Yeah. No, sorry, that's not a language delay. No, that's a not. It's that's, just discovery. It's a trick question. Yeah, it's a trick sorry. question. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah, yeah, it's not a language. You're spoiling delay. it. Uh, so, <laughs> you're spoiling it. Uh, no, because, and you wanted to say something there in the corner, and then I'm going to. Uh, Hello. Um, yes. Well, this is a very important point indeed. Uh, I've got two kids, uh, bilingual, uh, simultaneous bilingual kids, Italian and Dutch. And actually, they are now indeed in the school uh, with this CETO, especially the, well, the first one, uh, Group 8. Uh, well, I will be short. Uh, I will limit myself to say that it's been really hard uh, to, to talk about these topics. I'm an insider, in a way, into language and stuff. I'm, I'm a philosopher myself and I've worked also with some people here. Um, indeed, it's a little bit vague because you don't know what the criterion is to yeah. uh, define what the language, Which language is. It's complex. As far as I've researched, I didn't find really uh, the, 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 the last question to this because indeed it's vague. Um, actually, I want to be radical about this. The brain is multilingual from the word go and actually monolingualism is kind of, of unnatural. And, and two, uh, actually, often it is forgotten where we are and we are, where we are coming from because there is history behind and especially in Europe uh, there has been actually the birth of secular states uh, centuries ago. So the language that we speak as monolingual persons is the product actually of centuries of construction. But not our natural uh, way, so, so to say. We can we can speak German, Italian, Dutch, Polish, but this is a, 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 something is a, is a product of uh, of of actual power, and this is too often forgotten. It's getting philosophical. Yeah, it is. And yeah, and I, 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 yes. I'll, I'll have to stop you because there are really a lot more questions, and we're running out of time. Although it is very interesting, um, I, I, I'm very curious about just what you have your ideas about this question. Okay, I go to the end of the the, the story. Uh, my, my 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 kids actually are indeed uh, bilingual, but the the school suggests that they have logopedia uh, sessions, and this this is the dilemma, because if you say no, you don't collaborate with the school. But if you say yes, you collaborate with the school, but then these locopedia tests in the Netherlands, but I think also in other countries, sure. are constructed, not and validated, on a monolingual population yeah. across the country. Yeah. So, they have, so they're, they're testing the language, basically, they're testing the Dutch language. The results are misleading yeah. in this case. 
but the dilemma is there because then if you get actually the result that he's got a language delay tal achterstand then you maybe you can profit from a special help so maybe you want to say <laughs> well, support. Oh, yes well yeah. maybe it's yeah, better maybe language it delay i've heard those things yeah well it depends yeah okay yeah well i understand yeah Bilingualism does not lead to, to the language delay. And what I mean, it, everybody who says taalachterstand or language delay it usually is referring to a delay in the Dutch language, of course. And what the CETO is measuring is your uh, competence in the Dutch language and not in language, your language ability in general. So bilingualism it can never be the cause for a language delay or whatever. It could be a delay in like your vocabulary in Dutch, but that will gradually uh, 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 get better, and uh, so it will never be evens up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's my language delay in English. <laughs> <laughs> okay, children who mix two languages have a good command of both languages. Is it true or false? Mm -hmm. True. Uh, uh, so this is true, and who says true? It's one reaction. I'll go there for now because I saw it. Yeah. Gonna catch it? There you go. There you think it's true? I think it's. I, I read it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it was so first, that's, uh, yeah, my you read first it opinion so. was it's wrong, like code switching and so on. Like, the uh, example for today, I said to my son, four years old, yeah. Dutch, Polish, to um, vieje. Uh, it's uh, it wide here. Yeah. The wind is here, and he said, "No, that need to wide to vieje." He made the to vieje in Dutch. Uh, I cannot repeat it right, but he made it. He made it right in yeah. Dutch. He which actually, it right, or he made it into a pro in a Dutch in his Dutch system, yeah. Yeah. which to is from tot, yeah. which is a. Um, so it was uh, very creative, actually. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, it was linguistically very intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> Really <laughs> um, so a little uh, confirmation. Yeah, because usually it's, to it's considered to be uh, <laughs> wrong or to be a sign of delay, but it's usually only temporary and can be caused by lack of vocabulary in one or the other language. But it could be very, yeah, very well. Like this example, mama mangiamo patate crunciose stasera. I think that's a bit like what you just exemplified. Like, you use one language and fit in a word of another language just because you do, or you may find it more fitting, that word, because some languages just have better words. Yeah. Uh, age is the most important factor in acquiring a second language. True or not? I'm not going to, uh, <laughs> to just due to time management. Oh. Yeah, it's not the most important factor. We all were taught way back that you had this critical stage up to a certain age and that you needed to learn a language before that because otherwise you're just totally lost and you can never, well, age can be still, is still relevant, of course, it's still very relevant as a factor, but and together with other factors like a talent, but language input, so the, the, the amount of language that you hear or use is far more important than the age. So you can be two and then hear English every once in a while, but still not being able to speak that language because you just hear it every once in a while, not every day or a couple of hours per day. So I think this is the last one. If you want your child, or a child, to acquire two languages, it is very important to keep those languages well separated. Who says true? See some? True? Okay. It's, there's no education, indication sorry, that the separation will help. What is true is that it may help parents uh, having a, st a strategy to, um, to, 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 uh, to make sure that the input, the language input of the different languages is made sure of. So it's usually said or advised 
as a strategy rather than that you need to do that because otherwise the child will get totally mixed up and will mix up the languages and that it gets a total mess. So that's actually not true. So why actually choose for multilingualism or bilingualism? I mean, we're all full of it and we love it, but just learning Dutch and uh, having high CITO scores and good school results, why not just learn Dutch? Well, it has a tremendous amount of positive effects, which we've already heard also from Marina, and um, also not even uh, linguistic and educational, but also social. So I've just put a list of it, so if somebody comes up to you and say, why bother ever raising your child with four or five languages? Well, these benefits are just shown by research. You have linguistic benefits, of course, ease in acquiring other languages, a larger vocabulary, so you, you can use it from all these languages that you know, uh, cognitive benefits that we've already heard, but also social benefits. And uh, for your identity, it's so, much, so important to have your positive attitudes towards other cultures and other languages and other people, uh, social contact, uh, communication, uh, communicational efficiency, so you, a child will immediately feel and know which language to use uh, when he speaks to a person, or that, that's just a social, uh, yeah, something that, that bilingual children have more than monolingual children. And so, what does it take? Well, not nothing, a lot, in fact. You have to learn about bilingualism and bilingual development to know if you're on the right track and if, if things are going well. And uh, especially set and plan for your goals because if you just, well, do nothing or have no idea and just lead the way or as we say in Dutch, op zijn beloop laten, you probably end up with a lot of confusion or you find out after a while, oh well, oh, I wish I did, had done this or that. And it's, so to plan and, and set a goal of what you want your child to acquire and what not, and to what extent, like read, write or only speak, uh, that really helps and also to make it realistic. So if you want your child to learn uh, a language that your husband speaks, and he's the only one that speaks that language and he's only around after 7 p.m., then it will get rather difficult or you have to find somebody else who will also speak that language. Uh, talk to your children about it and what they want or what they like, if they're old enough, of course. Uh, talk to other people, school especially, but also family and friends because they also have opinions and strong strong opinions on how and why and why not. And know when to get help and where to get help before, uh, well, before you think you're getting in trouble or uh, it goes wrong. Um, so I already told you that language input, uh, the amount of language, of a certain language that a child hears is very important. And, um, well, what kind of language input and how it should be rich and varied. So, um, for example, you could speak one language at home by both or one person, and at school you can hear another language. And it, if you make sure that these the, both these languages are uh, rich and vary, varied, so it should not be one person, preferably more persons that speak that language, and also speak it in like reading and listen, uh, listening to the radio or watching television, so in different domains. Um, qualitative language education, making sure that the child hears a lot, listening, storytelling and reading can help. And in that respect, I want to show you a bit of Langaroo, the multilingual website I mentioned before that we've been working on with the Four Lays Express. Uh, and have launched a year, exactly a year ago almost. Um, this is a multilingual website and it's especially intended for parents to work on the home language. At least that's how we intended it. Because um, 
we found, well, I'm going to tell you a bit about how it came to be. Um, we did it with several partners. I will not read them all, but you can see there's a lot of people who have been working on it uh, and were involved. And what we observated was that there was a little awareness among parents about what they could do to stimulate the development of the home language or the language uh, of their child. And, uh, but also how to create this environment at home. Uh, they felt insecure and incapable. They always think, oh, I'm going to send my kid to school and that's where they learn. I, what can I do? Um, and in fact, there was not enough material available in the home language or to practice with their home language. So you can always say to parents, uh, well, go to the library, they will have and, and get some books, but they're not always books in the home language. Or you can tell them, well, just speak to your child or play games with your child and use your own language. But a lot of parents actually find that very difficult because it's not common in their culture or they're just not <coughs> used to that. So we thought we're going to make something that is accessible very easily so you do not have to leave your house. You just have something what everybody uses every day, preferably all day long. Uh, your phone or your tablet or computer um, and make it for parents and children to engage together in interaction because we all know that interaction will, is most stimulating to develop a language and uh, do that in their mother tongue and the form that we thought of was that it was online and free uh, so you do not have to pay and um, it is directly accessible to relevant content so you do not have to read all kinds of things so also people that are less literate can actually engage in this game or at this uh, website it's visual content not too much text it's playful and people can directly do something and bring something into practice five but now it's english dutch arabic Turkish and Polish, and you can choose the language, and in this language you can uh, watch videos uh, for now, we also what, would like to add games and things like that, and you have videos with or without text in the mother language, and uh, questions for the parents to discuss with their child, and you can choose for, from a level of the language level of the child, and uh, that, would, that should stimulate the interaction between the parent and the child. Do come afterwards to me because I will be uh, outside with a tablet where I can show you how it works and you can just take a look at the whole program. Thank you. Very nice. Um, yes, time is, uh, is running, but uh, the reason is a good one, because there are so many questions and so many, um, um, yeah, people are um, working with these problems on a daily basis, not working, but, you know, in your, in your family, in your, so it is important to have uh, these gatherings. Um, we're going to our last presentation. And that is from uh, Larinda Koster. Larinda, welcome. Yeah, warm applause. And uh, Larinda is an educational consul, consultant, uh, consultant uh, and researcher and uh, at RISPO and uh, volunteers for the RUTU Foundation. What is the RUTU Foundation? Uh, the RUTU Foundation is a non-profit organization here in Amsterdam. Uh, it originated in Suriname, which is why it's called RUTU, from Roots, mm -hmm. and it specializes in multilingual and intercultural educational practices. Great. And, um, well, you completed your master's degree in multilingualism and uh, from uh, at the University of Groningen, in the north of Holland, and you participated in the project AVIR. Yeah. Okay. And you want to tell us more about that in your yes. presentation? Indeed. Okay, well. Uh, we're curious to hear about it. Right. Good luck, Larinda. Thank you. Um, 
So before I decided to study something called multilingualism, I was an English teacher in secondary school. And uh, in one of my classes, there was always this student who was never really paying attention, always looking outside of the window, and didn't really participate in all the exercises. And at one point, I asked them, and I said, what is wrong? Don't you understand? Can I help you with anything? And they just moved everything forward, and they're like, no, teacher, it's too much. I don't understand it. So I said, what don't you understand? Uh, and he said, no, it's the language. It's too much. And then I found out that uh, actually English was the fifth language of the students. And that got me really interested. And I thought, what does it mean that a language is too much? And I asked my other uh, students in my class. And then it turned out that 19 of my 25 students were actually bilingual or multilingual, which I did not know about. And I found that incredibly interesting. So I wanted to know more about that. Um, so I studied, and I studied more, and I studied multilingualism. And eventually came on this project, which is called Avior. Avior is named after a star that is not seen from the Northern Hemisphere, which really shows sometimes the hidden language skills that students bring to class. Um, and I'm going to talk about something really practically, uh, because we wanted to find out how can we help parents and schools with this multilingualism. So we created multilingual teaching materials. Now, why did we do Avior? Um, research shows that statistically there is still an achievement gap between children with a migrant background and children who uh, are native. Um, and one of the things that research really shows is that the mother tongue or home languages are incredibly important to close this gap. Um, however, there is not enough attention given to mother languages in class uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, even though, as you can see here, um, the Netherlands is an incredibly multilingual country. We have um, many different people from all over the world. And in Amsterdam alone, there is about 185 languages that are spoken. So it's actually something that we need to talk about. So what did we do? We decided that we would like to try to improve basic numeracy and literacy skills by um, making a multilingual material. Um, we wanted to include maths as well as language, because of course when we talk about math, we also talk about language. Um, there is this one um, story that uh, we always get told about these um, math stories, which always says like, oh, um, Larinda wants to buy an apple, they want to buy three, but the store only has two. How many apples does she miss, for example? Um, but sometimes that is really a language question, and uh, even though it's about math, you really need to know the language in order to know what the question is. So, um, we wanted to use these types of materials. We ran it for about uh, three years, um, and because it's an Erasmus Plus project, we worked with different uh, countries all over Europe. So we worked with uh, partners from Germany, Croatia, Estonia, Italy, Greece, and here in the Netherlands. And it was incredibly interesting and valuable to see what different migrant populations are living in these countries, but what kind of problems do they deal with, um, and how uh, their systems uh, work. Um, we had a target group, which is young students from four to eight years old. So what did we do in this program? So we designed and selected and translated about 25 bilingual material. We had math, uh, language material, we have games, and we have vocabulary posters. And we have them in about 14 language combinations. Uh, this includes the national languages of the partner countries that we work with, but also uh, big groups of migrant uh, languages, uh, such as Arabic, Polish, Chinese, um, and Turkish. Uh, we tested these materials in schools. We've created user manuals to explain how to use these materials. And we visited each other in our country to see how do the materials work in schools. And I really want to focus on uh, the case studies that we did, which was all about uh, how to include parent participation with schools. So here we see a picture of a couple of parents um, and visitors in one of our schools here in Amsterdam. So what, does, what do the material look like, first of all? This is just a short selection. Um, here on the left we have a math material, which is um, one of the pages, which says what is larger, 
to, um, for younger children to really see how do you count that. So it's really about counting. This is, for example, in German and Turkish. Then the middle one is one of our language posters that we made. We made about 14 of them, including all kinds of um, names or um, words for head, body parts, but also what do you see in the classroom, your family members. Um, and I wanted to show this particular uh, example because this is in Croatian and Bayash. Um, and Bayash is a language that is spoken amongst Roma people, which live uh, all over Europe. Uh, their nomadic people used to be referred to as the gypsy people. Um, but Bayash was a language that was not written yet in Croatia. So in this project they also started to write down this language, which was really, really interesting uh, for parents. And uh, it was such an emotional thing to finally not only see their language spoken, but also on paper recognized as an actual language. Um, and on the right we have one of our stories, which is um, a Dutch-Polish story, which is about a chick. And this chick in his chicken class um, is left out. And the story is something that parents can read, and then the final question is, what do you do to include um, this chick? Or what do you do when you see a friend who is left out? So it's also a bit of a moral story. Um, so, um, what did we do? We had two schools in the Netherlands, one in Amsterdam and one in Rotterdam. The schools decided which parents they wanted to reach, so in this case, uh, we had parents who spoke Polish, Arabic and Turkish. However, when we met the parents in the um, school in Amsterdam, the parents said, but we do not really speak Arabic, we speak Berber, which is a different language than Arabic, which was interesting. Um, however, they said Berber is a language that we only speak, but we still write in Arabic. So we can read uh, everything that is on the material, but we will speak it in our own language. Um, so we included everyone in this process, the director of the school, teachers, internal supervisors and parents. We really think that if you want to include multilingualism in schools, having the support of a director and of teachers is very important. Um, but also parents, because as we mentioned before, it's really important that parents are also um, coll collaborative in the process, learning process for their children. Um, and we had incredibly positive outcomes in this project, which was really, really nice to see. So one of the parents in Rotterdam said that it was really nice to spend time with the children, um, but they also said that they also learned Dutch, because in schools, sometimes they, for example, talked about the math material here, and they said, I did not know the Dutch word for multiply, or the Dutch word for fractions, and now I know. And I can read it in Polish, but I also learned these words now in Dutch, which is really nice. And they said that their daughter was incredibly happy always to work with the material with them. Um, another parent in Amsterdam said that there's more contact. Um, the teacher does the same exercises um, that we do at home. So what we did, for example, we said, here is a story, please read it in your own language at home. Then you come back to the school and the school talks does the same story in Dutch, but the children have already heard it before in their own language, so they're more easy to keep up. Um, and they did it with other um, materials as well. Um, but what actually happened, which is something that we didn't account for, is that a lot of the parents always um, speak in their own language group. So you have the Turkish group parents, you have many different groups of parents. But because we sent this material to the different parent groups, they now spoke with each other more. So this parent says, I have more contact with other parents, I now also talk to the Turkish and Spanish parents, whereas before I would not do that, or I would only speak to the parents of my own language. So there was more collaboration. Um, when, I, when we asked the teachers, um, they said, the teacher said that they um, started to think more about multilingualism, um, and they immediately already started to think about different ways of implementing these multilingual practices. So in this case, this teacher said, um, we have younger students and older students who we now match up together, for example, as language buddies. And then in one of the classes, when we do math, we say, okay, you come together, speak about it in your own language, and then come back to us in Dutch. Um, so 
this child said, uh, we have now have a child who helps a younger student in, uh, with math. Um, but what the teacher initially was afraid of is that when they would talk in their own language, that uh, they would not talk about schoolwork anymore. And the teacher said, because I couldn't understand it, I wasn't able to control what was happening. But she said, now that I've let it run, what always happened is that when the child finally understood it, they would always come back and say that to me in Dutch. So I would always know that they would talk about it in their own language, otherwise they wouldn't be able to give me the answer to the question. So even though they couldn't understand the process, the answer was still in Dutch and um, that was really helpful for this teacher. Um, and one of the directors of the school said that it's the curriculum that connects the parents to the school, uh, which is why it's so important to always collaborate together. Um, and this Avio project offered them the reason to have that connection between parents, teachers, and of course the child being the center. Um, and I would like to show you a video of one of the teachers who also worked in this project. And they were doing something called identity texts, which is um, that the child has to write a story about something that happened to them. And um, this is what she said. Oh, sorry. Before we do that, <laughs> um, one of the things that was really nice is that we saw um, in the schools, we saw actually languages um, being shown. So all the languages were very visible. So in one of the schools, they had welcome, uh, welcome wall in all the languages that were was available uh, in the school. Um, but also, sometimes the children had their own ideas. And in this case, the children were asking themselves, what does a pig say in your language? <laughs> so, um, which was really nice to see because even though we have materials, sometimes the children cannot come up with their own creative ideas um, to help them and to make this. Um, all right, I think now we have... Your, your um, the exercise you did with the identity text. Um, this is a school that's focused on learning Dutch. That's the focus. How do you explain that you let children write in their own language about, their, about themselves? How does that help them learn Dutch? Yeah, that's a question that people, of course, ask a lot. Um, yeah, and I, I always, yeah, you make two points in my uh, in my answer. Uh, the first one is just that by accepting the child and welcoming the child into the school and making him feel safe and feel proud and feel welcomed, uh, that is good for the well-being of the child, and the well-being of the child is positively related to any learning in school. Um, and so, for them to be able to participate, I also think it's just yeah, more important for them to participate than for them to, yeah, write down three Dutch words. What do they learn from, from that, from not participating? Uh, so that's the one thing. And then the other thing is especially when they get help and translate their stories to Dutch. That is such a rich experience for children because they actually get to hear those words and see those words that are important for their story, the Dutch words for their story and imagine me standing in front of the classroom and reading their story in Dutch. They might actually understand what I'm saying even though their Dutch is still at a very low level but they wrote the story so they know where it starts and what is in the middle and what is in the end and they might pick up uh, exactly what is important for them. Uh, so that, that I always try to uh, uh, yeah, work that way as well, but I think the, the bottom line is just by accepting the, the languages into the classroom, it opens up the full brain of the children. They are ready to make more connections, uh, they feel appreciated, and uh, yeah, for me that's, at least for the, the lesson series and the identity text, that's the most important thing. I remember from the, the speech of uh, uh, Professor Cummins that he, he quoted a girl, a 10 or 11 year old girl who had been working on identity text and she really liked it and she said yeah I was really happy because before that I was in a classroom and I only got coloring pages and I'm so much more than a coloring page and that really hurt my soul because that's what I did for a long time kids came into the classroom and I would be like ah yeah I have nothing to do for you let's give you a coloring page and I totally stopped doing that or I gave them books with stupid non-verbal activities that you would give to, to kindergarten uh, kids 
just to keep them busy. And now I feel like, hey, what is the message that you give to children if you give them work that is obviously not for them, way too easy for them? So I'd rather have them participate by using their mother tongue or maybe by only listening to what is happening. That's also okay. But taking them seriously, I think it's so, so important. So, yeah, this teacher really turned it around, which is really nice to see. Um, the materials that we created are downloadable for free for everybody because we uh, didn't want copyright on it. You can see that on the second one, avi or risco.org. We have them in 14 language combinations um, and everybody can print them off uh, and use them, whether at home or in school. <laughs> Um, and together we also created a new project called the Language Friendly School, which is all about creating networks for schools to help them open up all the languages and be language friendly, um, to really make languages visible in schools. So, yeah. What I see and what you often hear, and I think somebody else also mentioned that, is often the um, intelligence and uh, knowing a language is, is falsely combined, right? Uh, so if, if a child doesn't speak the language, it's probably not that intelligent, or if a person doesn't speak a certain language, which of course happens a lot and which is very bad, I think it's very sad to see that. Um, thank you very much. Um, I want to speed up a little bit because we're running out of time and I think also of your energy. Yes, I understand. It's all interesting, but it's a lot. It's a lot to, to capture. Um, we did have a, a short uh, uh, quiz, but I think we're going to skip that. And we want to we wanna end this afternoon with a, uh, a short uh, panel discussion. So if you give me one moment, we'll put on the chairs uh, here on stage. If you have to go to the bathroom, make it quick, come back, and then we have a really nice final panel discussion. Uh, and, and then afterwards, we'll have a drink together and we can talk even more. Yeah? Thank you so much. Um, first I would like to present to you um, somebody you didn't meet uh, this afternoon yet. Uh, and she's a coordinator of um, uh, of the Four Lays Express, one of the partners also of the OBA of this library. Uh, Afa, uh, Ala, sorry, Ala Khalifa. Welcome. And, uh, and uh, the other partner, of course, Bojena from Lo Locomotiva, please. Um, because. Um, I was curious because you both got, got into this multilingualism thing uh, and we heard a bit of your story and I was so curious about yours. Uh, how did you get to the uh, Vorlees Express and what, what is your background? Okay, uh, thank you for the invitation first of all. And uh, I got involved with the Vorlees Express because um, I grew up bilingual as well. Uh, what languages? Kurdish, mm -hmm. uh, Iraq. My parents came to the Netherlands when I was four years old, and so I grew up bilingual as well. And I was, my parents have six children, and I was the only one that got really into reading. I went to the library, I read a lot of uh, Dutch books. So I'm the only one that's well, well advanced in Dutch, and the rest of my siblings are a bit not taalachtstand, but it's not taalachtstand. I've mm. just learned today. <laughs> <laughs> it will come. It's yeah. just yeah, it's just a phase. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I saw Forlays Express, and I think that's a really nice project to help children not only develop a good language, but also uh, have fun in reading and stories and be more creative. So. I really liked I really liked the uh, Forlays Express, and uh, I think it's really important for the education of the children. So. And and who is doing this? I mean, who is so so? There there are parents reading for their children, and, but oh, also no. reading for other children. Explain to me how no, does so, it work? So it's a project that uh, vrijwilligers, like uh, volunteers, mm -hmm. uh, go to a uh, well a family, mostly families that are migrants or um, uh, bilingual as well, and they. As a volunteer, they read every week for 10 weeks, I think. Uh, 
to one of one or two children of the family to help them uh, get more familiar with reading, with the Dutch language, with the culture, but also just gaining fun. And after the 10 weeks, uh, it's supposed to be like one of the parents or both parents uh, pick it up. Like they keep on reading because voorlezen, reading is very Dutch, I believe, because I didn't grow up with voorlezen at all and it's really Dutch. And I used to babysit for a Dutch family and it's always like, before they go to sleep, you have to fold a yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't fold the children. Like it's always like, oh no, you forgot the verhaaltje. So how is that in, in, in Poland? Do, yeah. do you read stories before yes. you go to bed? Or? Yes, we do. But actually, my, my parents didn't do it that much. But I know the, the, the later generations, they, they did. Yeah. Uh, they told me stories. Okay. They okay. didn't read it, but they told me stories. Yeah. Stories. Yeah, telling stories. I mean, storytelling is also in a lot of cultures, eh? maybe not in, uh, in a, from a book, but the, the, the telling the stories of ancestors or whatever. Is that, is that known in your culture? Yeah, uh, my, uh, my mom uh, does a lot of uh, storytelling from her, uh, from her uh, like past and stuff like that. So well, what, is, what is the best story, you know? Um, no, I have so many stories. But <laughs> oh, that's good. That's so. That's a rich storytelling mom. Great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we know something about your background. Uh, well, not your background, but I mean your 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 family situation. We heard a little bit, yeah, about about your son and so. Um, but the funny thing is, I mean, you're now um, uh, putting all your energy also in in this locomotiva. But what was your original? Thing. What is your passion? What do you do on a daily basis? I mean, before you went into this. I'm a musician, actually. I play the cello, which is, actually I think is another language. Music is mm -hmm. also another language. And you can absolutely express yourself. You, you read, you read notes, so you read, so you can uh, express yourself the way you play, and you can play it very differently. So actually, I should say, I speak six languages. Not really. <laughs> yeah, that's true, the language of music, right, right. Great, well, we saw the, the, the language of whistling. Did you ever hear about that? You, you know, you know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my mom told me about it. Yeah. <laughs> mom. Yeah. All right. I never heard it, and I think I think it's really great. And I was like, okay, how can you know what what is being said and what is great, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, we, there's also language with the, also with sound, with the drum, with the drums, and the, yeah, communicate. but communicate. I think that every family has its own language as well, because mm -hmm. when I ever when I talk to my parents or someone else, we just mix Dutch and English and uh, Kurdish all together, and only she can understand me. But if I talk to another <laughs> Kurdish pe person, then she doesn't. Understand we also have a yeah. secret Is that, language. Do people recognize that? Yeah, yeah I see nice. hats shaking. Yeah, we have words in our family which yeah. come from different languages. Yeah. Like yeah. what we want to say. Yeah, <laughs> it was also it's also funny to hear. Uh, I think it was with you, Anna. Uh, that you said, or I don't know. Um, uh, some words are just better in the in the other language. I mean, uh, some words really sa they say it all. Yeah. You you know, it's not. It's it, there's another word for it. For example, in Dutch, but in that other language, it's just the words meant to say it, right? Yeah. So, okay, nice. Um, I I would l love to invite you all uh, next to us, um, Karin, Marinella, Anna, and Laurinda. Please have a seat, if you. Yeah. Marinella. Well, we heard, uh, yeah, I gave you that one. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> it, it works good, doesn't it? <laughs> um, we heard so many things uh, this afternoon about language and how to use it and what the possibilities are by law and uh, what uh, parents can do for their children and, and, and so on and so on. Um, um, how important, I mean, we talked, I heard it all already this afternoon, but still, how important is the support of, of the school? Because, of course, sometimes you might have an idea as a parent, but the school doesn't support it. But how important is it uh, uh, for the development of the identity of the child? And uh, I really loved your anecdote about this mountain. You said there's this monument, a uh, mountain, sorry, this monument of the tree. And uh, you really need the roots. So who, who would like to comment on that? The identity of the child. Go ahead. Actually, if I can just say a few words, why actually my story, why my, 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 this 
actually going out of hand because I'm a musician, but I'm really into multilingual upbringing uh, because it started actually with my own child that I didn't know enough about it. We were bringing him up trilingual and it was actually 17 years ago, that was before the internet was uh, taking over. And to find the information wasn't that easy. Yeah. Um, and the school wasn't giving us any support. Mm -hmm. they, they were not telling us at all. You, they were on the contrary. Us, yeah, on the contrary, mm -hmm. speak Dutch. And that felt so wrong, actually. Um, that That's how it all started. We started a Polish school to support the children with mm -hmm. their identity, mm -hmm. which actually really got out of hand because we started with a small group and then now we have more than 180 on the waiting list. Um, so it's becoming a serious business. Yeah. <laughs> but we see also how important it is for those kids yeah. to know where they come from. Yeah, yeah no, no, and I don't... Uh, I not only for the for the child, but also for the for the parent. I think because I remember once that um, I was talking to a group of parents, and that the the whole issue of speaking your own language to your child and not uh, speaking Dutch, uh, and and that it was so important that it's so important to use your own language. And she was like. Can I speak my own language? Am I allowed? Am I allowed? And that really was very emotional for her because that's what her identity was about, yeah. her language. So it's not only the child, but especially in the relation yeah. between the child and the parent, I think. And about accepting as well, because yeah. otherwise we go back to the choice. Do you prefer Dutch or the other language? Or do you feel more Dutch or the other identity? No. We have to accept them all, and I think that's very important. So, I, I, but I think there's this really a new approach that we that we can that we because I can relate to that in the sense that people always ask me, uh, do you feel more Moroccan or more Dutch? <laughs> very recognizable, I guess, for yeah. a lot of people. Uh, well, I feel both. Is that okay? <laughs> and, and and the same is happening yeah, with or language. Maybe more one in one situation and more. Dutch but in the other or whatever. A lot yeah. of Montalembas never have been only one, so they don't even know what yeah. it is to be only Dutch or only something else. So it doesn't exist for them, this problem. So I think the whole question is... And, I, and I think what uh, Nello uh, said at one point, uh, our brain is really capable of doing much more than we think. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I use the three languages on a daily basis and I catch myself that I have to write something in English or in Dutch, but I'm listening to the news. Uh, for example, I'm writing in English and I'm listening to the news in a Dutch. And Miraculously, I can yeah. understand it. Yeah. It sort of goes into both yeah. languages into my head. So, you know, we only use sort of was it twenty percent of our uh, cap capability of our brain. Mm -hmm. The rest, yeah. kind of miracles. I, I would like to to stress again the the, the importance of the schools, you know, and the school system. Yeah. Obviously, we have a, a situation. You now you have to look at the history. You know, and uh, society is changing a lot and quickly, you know, very quickly. So um, looking at history, we can explain you know, why things were as they were. And uh, Why was it actually? What, what, yeah. what were the insights at that time? Well, uh, the, the, the migration was, was, was lack of knowledge, absolutely, lack of knowledge. And there was also um, the need for education was very important. Mm -hmm. no? So now everyone is going to school. Uh, if we look at 40 years ago, 50 years ago, it wasn't uh, for, for a huge part no, of the population. Going to school wasn't still an exception. No, so uh, this whole idea of going to school and learning no, is, is relatively new. Uh, the whole migration part is relatively, relatively new, so there are many more people with many more diff different language backgrounds now in the Netherlands and uh, all over Europe. Um, so that's very important. On the other hand, we have the whole discussion on uh, language learning. No, we think it's so important to know more languages. We want to be, uh, no, a global person. No, uh, with the whole mondialisering. No, so we need to know many languages. No, that's important. We have this uh, policy of the three languages. Well, stick to them first of all, but allow or. or four or five, whatever. Yeah, but at least of the languages that are already there. That are yeah. there. So we, so we have really to validate and, and, and to, 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 
to allow these children no, and others that speak other languages to, to validate them in the schools. That is a very, very basic issue. And I think we really should try uh, or start a trial if schools are not starting to do it. Mm -hmm. no? Because the law is there and we should, we, we are able to do it. Yeah. You know? So this change really needs to start very rapidly. I would like to make a little sidestep here. Uh, what about street language? What about slang? Um, it's, it's so funny because I, uh, in, in the southeast here in Amsterdam, southeast in the Belmar, you have like uh, bins, which is uh, the local yeah, slang, uh, however you call it. And I just learned that in the library here in the Oba, there is a dictionary of Smebanese. Really? How about that? How about street language? Is that also... Smebanese. Hmm? What is Smebanese? Smebanese is the language being spoken in uh, a street language slang. And uh, uh, yeah, using uh, influences from all different languages being used in Holland. And there's a new slang. How, how about that? Does that also contribute to the child's identity, for example? Is, is it important as well? Or should schools say, hey, no, but that is slang, leave that out. That's something else. Um, well, I think if we talk about languages being valuable, I think we need to consider all different linguistic capabilities of everybody. Mm -hmm. What we hear often is that a teacher, uh, if we not, don't talk about straight language, but they say, oh, it's great if you learn English or you learn French, because that's a good language, but please don't bother with you know, migrant languages, which is such a weird thing to say because all languages are equal. And with street language and slang, it's such a creative way to use languages and uh, it really shows in part of identity because slang and street language is really used among younger uh, people. It really shows their identity and it really shows their creativity, what they can do with language, but also it shows what language is. In every, uh, in every city there is different uh, st uh, street language here in the Netherlands. The street language in Rotterdam is much more uh, focused on the Cap Verdean language. Street uh, language here in Amsterdam is much more on Surinamese or uh, other Arabic um, words. So, and also when we look at art or when we look at music here in the Netherlands, especially hip hop artists, mm -hmm. uh, they use different slang and they use language in such an interesting creative way, which really shows how much language is um, a part of our identity in every way. Yeah. Yeah, I understood actually that Google is busy with uh, writing an emoji language. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If, yeah. You can, <laughs> if you can play with languages, that means that you that you know the languages. Yeah, so that's the that's most important. But do you, yes. do you mean that, that it could be a danger or something? Or? Could be, I, I, I don't know. Mm. Could it, it, is, that's no, there's not. Okay, that's, that's yes. good to know. It sounds like more like a social act, so something that you use in a particular group. So it will, I don't think that it will probably, yeah, it might enter the classroom or teachers might uh, have trouble with understanding, but it, yeah, <laughs> I don't think it's no, no. It's, it's uh, we work with pupils in, uh, in a school in Amsterdam West, Marcotti College, last year. And we were talking about languages and also obviously street language came into the classroom and they were really proud of it. Yeah. But he also showed that it's a it's a changing thing, yeah. you know, it's moving all the time. And it relates to the playground within Amsterdam, yeah. each school, but even each group of people yeah. know yeah. together have their own form. It's, it's kind of a uh, secret language. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's but, it's, but it's important that there's also room for all these kind of subcultures, yeah. Um, how important is multilingualism for the de development and the growth um, of the empathy of a child? And what I mean by that is, and, and we heard some of that as well, um, if you know one language, you know one truth and one culture and one, then that is what you know. If you know more languages, how, how does that work in the mind? I mean, automatically you know more cultures, you know more about other people, you're not afraid for other people, how is that? Could you Yeah, I think it, to that? it's only getting better, yeah. Uh, your empathy is growing because you, uh, you feel related to more people, more backgrounds. Um, so I, I feel Dutch, but I also feel Kurdish, but I also feel Middle Eastern or whatever. And I think you, it's more of a connection with other people and cultures mm -hmm. and it creates just more empathy. 
Yeah. And acceptance. And acceptance. Yeah. 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 Because you also know from very early uh, on that the people are different. Yeah. yeah. Not exactly. everybody yeah. is the same. Yeah. Yeah. Because your mom speaks this language, yeah. and your father this yeah. language. Okay, so it means that child is different. Mm -hmm. And then it's normal. For and then. And then the rest, and the, and then the rest automatically follows up. Let me. Uh, if or you, yeah, if you know that you eat at six in Holland and at eight uh, o'clock in Italy or at ten uh, in Spain, I don't know. Then it's uh, logical that maybe there are uh, population who eat at four o'clock or they don't eat. Nothing at all. is strange I mean, anymore. That, yeah, it's, it's just normal. Yeah. yeah, and that does a lot with your brain automatically. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we also mustn't forget how emotional language is. Mm -hmm. I've heard so many stories about parents who said, when the teacher said to me, I couldn't speak my language, how hurt I was. Or um, even teachers uh, saying, oh, but I, you know, I feel um, scared when I hear a language I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And it's really something that you have to look into yourself and um, be uh, show more empathy for uh, somebody. Um, but most of the time what we also hear is that teachers are already doing multilingual practices, they're already saying it's okay to speak your own language, but they don't know if that's okay. It just feels right. Mm -hmm. So really, we mustn't never um, mm -hmm. underestimate the emotion that comes with language mm -hmm. uh, as well. And to be open as well, because I used to work at a, a practitioner, a uh, huisarts, mm -hmm. in the Achterstandsbuurt, like in the ghetto of Rotterdam, and she only speak, spoke uh, Dutch, and then there was a, lot, a huge population of Turkish people, and most of the, the women uh, didn't speak a word of Dutch. And then we hired a, a Turkish-speaking uh, practitioner, and it was flown with all the women with um, problems that were all already there for years, but they just couldn't express themselves in their own language. So it just, uh, for me, it was like, it's so important to just know how to speak, how to express yourself, even if it's like a different language, but it's about your body and your health and yeah, yeah. It just shows how important it is to. So it's a, it's a whole social yeah. social packet actually. Yeah. The language is a start for a lot of yeah. more things. Even though they used to bring like a translator with them, but it's not the same. Being, yeah, yeah, being able to do it by yourself in your own language that that's a huge difference for them. So let's say all those people that back in the days were told, oh, you have to speak Dutch, and they're now getting doctors and lawyers and whatever, they, they will get the advantage of, of yeah, speaking different languages and being able to help certain groups in, in society. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you make the connection. Mm -hmm. You're able to connect. Yeah. And one of the strange things I always find is that when the child is younger, it's always a problem. But when it's an adult and they can speak this language, they're like, okay, great, wow, wow yeah. amazing. Yeah. So we really must foster it when they're young, so they're able to speak all these languages. Yes. Uh, and, when they're old. and it is easier when they are younger, because they want to communicate. The child is being born to communicate, so that's the brain is kind of open for communication. It's the only thing what they want to do is actually try to express that they are hungry. Uh, and it doesn't matter in which language it is, so they will learn that. And then later on we all know it, how difficult it is to learn another language. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's, it's good to, to reflect a bit on the, on the research part, no? because uh, Real linguistic research, and especially uh, research on multilingual children no, and, and how they develop, etc., or also people at an, an elder age, it's still at a, at a very uh, low, low level. Yeah. No, we still don't know many things. We st actually still don't know exactly you know, how to deal exactly with all those languages at, mm -hmm. at an early age. Um, so, um, and especially with respect to linguists, no? looking at languages and understanding what language is, no? all the different aspects of the core grammar and how they relate no? and the cross-linguistic properties of languages. I think, and still this is, so it is relatively new, no? this kind of research. And, 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 uh, so actually the development is going faster than um, the than, than knowledge there is. Is, well, is that a bad I, thing? I, is that, is I, I that always... Is, that's, in some sense, it's always like that, but um, look now at, at, uh, at the corona. But um, uh, there is a lot of knowledge. There is a lot of, a lot of uh, since uh, 30, 40, 50 years, a lot of languages have been described and compared to one another. Uh, and and so, so there are a lot of grammars and a lot of, lot of cross-linguistic uh, 
um, documents, uh, etc. Um, but still, the step to the teacher training institute still needs to be made. You know? Slowly it starts now, but it's still a big step to be made. And then the teachers themselves you know, have to adapt it. And we have all those teachers already in the schools, and they, well, they have to keep up with this knowledge. Keep up so with it's, uh, at all levels, at the same time, we are trying to, to deal with it. Yeah. And um, with all, all that being said, uh, aren't we losing Dutch as a language? <laughs> Not yet, I think. <laughs> is, 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 is there a danger of um, uh, giving all this attention to all these different languages and then at the end, hey, where did Dutch go? No, that's the biggest misunderstanding. Uh, it is? Yes, it is, because bilingualism or multilingualism is, is different languages. That means that if you go to school in Holland, you just speak Dutch, and so you're not losing it. The yeah. other language, we, we but yes. we we do know very well what is happening now. No, in in, in the scientific fields within universities in in higher education. Uh, so English is taking the oh, place, yeah, okay. no, of of yeah. Dutch. That's true, and it's going down. Yeah, it's okay. But is, is that a, is that a bad thing, or is that just? normal evolution about well it is English, it's in, uh, in 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 no. in some way you can say well let it go no that's what happens we want to have all these students from korea or, or wherever they come from no it's they bring money here yeah, it's, it's economic money. Fish, yeah. Yeah, economically it's it's interesting we can also say okay it's also interesting no to 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 share ideas um but what i would like to do much more uh, and what I wanted, I, I did it a little bit by using Dutch and English at the same time, is trying to communicate in this, in, 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 uh, in different languages at the same time. You know? And you can use different methods uh, by, by, uh, by uh, uh, having a PowerPoint in one language or in two languages, but having maybe also another person that can wrap up. No, in another language, but it's it's silly to to exclude all those other languages, also of all those foreign students, because they come here, they have an, a, a Spanish, Portuguese, or, or, or a Slovakian background, no, and uh, they are here, but not just to do it in English. They are going back to their own country. They have to translate the, the stuff they have learned, no. In, into their own context. So uh, I think really we should try to start uh, creating multilingual uh, contexts in all levels of, of education, uh, for sure. One other thing that I always, uh, what we have with uh, primary schools, for example, is we always say we're only bringing, we're adding something. We're not taking mm -hmm. anything away from, from anything. Mm -hmm. When we talk about multilingual practices in schools, um, you use, in the process of the assignment, you use all your linguistic repertoire that you have, but the final communication of the assignment <coughs> might still be in Dutch or in English or whichever the school language is. So it's not excluding one the other, it's just including, including, yeah. including everything. Yeah, yeah. I think... the home, uh, this is the school situation. Yeah. Yeah. For me, the multilingualism between home and school that's not taking away any Dutch. No. So no. Yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah, this, uh, these are two different uh, things. I think um, that's a good moment. You, you want to say last thing? I just wanted to say that it's obvious that from this conversation and from this afternoon that this is just the beginning. We have to start exactly. again <laughs> exactly. and talk more and involve more people and have more interaction. Yeah, that's what I wanted to conclude as well. Uh, and, and say, no, and add to that, uh, um, uh, there are new times, uh, new insights, uh, if we compare it to some time ago. And, um, well, in, in Amsterdam, over 60% is bilingual or knows more languages. So it's obvious we're heading to a new time and, and with, with new ideas. And isn't that exciting? It is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
all the speakers this afternoon. Thank you, Locomotiva, and thank you, the OBA, for hosting this event. Uh, please stay with us and have a drink in the back, and we can talk even more and get to know each other. And uh, I wish you all a very lovely weekend, and hope to see you next time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.